Um, welcome, we'll just might briefly welcome our witnesses. Uh, we have done some sound checking with Mr. Cox and Ms. Cameron, but Mr. Roberts, can we just do a quick sound check for you? Are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Excellent. Um, okay, so we're, sorry, apologies about that. We're just having some issues with the broadcast, um, which we're still working through. So very possibly the first part of this may not be broadcast live, but it is being recorded um, and will be available later. Uh, so we are now live. I uh, welcome everyone to the hearing of Portfolio Committee Number Four's inquiry into the electronic conveyancing adoption of national laws Amendment Bill 2022. Before I commence, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of, of the land on which Parliament sits, and would also like to pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals present. Today's hearing is being conducted virtually with all members of the committee, as well as witnesses attending remotely. I would ask for everyone's patience through any technical difficulties we may encounter today. If participants lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they ask to rejoin the hearing using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Today, we'll be hearing from a number of stakeholders, including representatives from the Australian Registers National E-Conveyancing uh, Council and New South Wales Registered General, legal, banking and conveyancing peak bodies, as well as two electronic lodgement network operators. I thank everyone for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about procedures. Today's hearing is being broadcast live by the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or other after you complete your evidence. I also note that we have witnesses appearing outside of New South Wales. Committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others under the protection of parliamentary privilege. In that regard, it is important that witnesses focus on the issues raised by the inquiry in terms of reference and avoid naming individuals unnecessarily. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness adopted to according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the house in 2018 and given the time frame for this inquiry the committee has resolved that there'd be no questions on notice or supplementary questions for this hearing finally a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimize disruptions and assist our hands hard reporters can i ask committee members to clearly identify who questions are directed to and could i ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking could everyone please mute, mute their microphones when they're not speaking and also return, remember to turn your microphones back on when you're getting ready to speak. If you start speaking while muted, please start your question or answer again so it can be recorded in the transcript. And members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other so we can all be heard clearly. Also to assist Hansard, may I remind members and witnesses, speak directly into the microphone and avoid making comments when your head is turned away. So I now welcome our first witnesses. Could each witness please state their name, position, title and swear either an oath or affirmation from the cards that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat? Um, we'll start with you, Mr Bruce Roberts. Uh, thank you. So my name is Bruce Roberts. I'm currently the Registrar of Titles of Western Australia. I also hold the role of the General Manager of the Registration Services Division of Landgate, which is a statutory authority in Western Australia. I am also currently the Chair of the uh, Australian Registrar's National uh, Conveyancing Committee. Uh, that's a role which I uh, became appointed in um, February of this year. Uh, in terms of my oath, which was the evidence uh, that I now am about to be to give to the committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, God. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jeremy Cox. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, my name's Jeremy Cox. I'm the New South Wales Registrar General and, and also a member of the Australian Registrar's along with Bruce. Um, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Uh, Ms Cameron. Uh, thank you, Chair. So my name is Danusha Cameron. I'm the Director of Regulation, Compliance and IT in the New South Wales Office of the Registrar General. 
Uh, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. And now, would either of the three of you like to make a short statement? And if, if you are, could you please keep it to no less than a couple of minutes? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to make a short statement, please. Uh, I'm currently in Perth, and I wish to pay my respects to the Wajak Noongar people, who are currently the traditional landowners of the lands of the southwest of Western Australia, and I wish to pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present, and emerging. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to address them. ARNIC uh, is responsible for the regulatory framework, regulation, and advising state and territory governments on proposed changes to the electronic conveyance in national law. The bill enacts the first set of statutory uh, obligations resulting from a program of work to enable competition between uh, electronic network operators or ill It also strengthens the oversight of LROs and the financial system. Uh, that they operate and to provide for enforcement of, regulatory, of the regulatory framework. It's needed to enable the development of the detail of those solutions. In 2021, after three years of analysis, a uh, review of the different market structures, independent reports, including uh, those in the HLC, IPART, and an independent cost benefit analysis, all the time working with, it, with industry and state and territory governments agreeing to a market structure with. The bill requires interoperability between LNOs and extends the registrar's authority to make national operating requirements to regulate it. After much consideration of the op uh, options to strengthen uh, oversight of financial settlement, the Council of Financial Regulators, which includes APRA, ASIC, the RBA, and the Treasury, concluded that the best solution is a self regulatory industry code jointly developed with electronic networks and financial institutions under the OzPay network. The bill supports this outcome by enabling registrars to require elders to participate in the code that is being developed in parallel. On enforcement, ministers have publicly committed to a single bill later this year to enact the enforcement provisions before interoperability is rolled out. Any remaining single issues requiring the amendment of the national bill can also be included in the second bill. This bill amends the national applied scheme, changes in your jurisdiction, New South Wales, and then implemented in other jurisdictions, and as required, all state and territory governments have agreed to this bill. ARNEC has and will continue to engage with all relevant stakeholders and with the work of other jurisdictional regulators, such as the ATRC and the Council of Financial Regulators, to implement the reforms. ARNEC is also planning to to assurance review, cyber security tests, and system readiness tests that must be satisfied. However, we need this bill now, certainly required for the LNOs, banks, language trees, and standard authorities to engage in the required development of work and to give industry confidence in the reform. But again, I want to thank the many stakeholders who have contributed a really great deal of time and expertise. This bill and even banks in more generally as well. We look forward to working with the stakeholders. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cox or Ms. Cameron, do you have any, a short statement? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to make a short statement if that's okay. Um, thank you also for giving me time um, and the Office of Registrar General Time to present to you today. I'm on the Central Coast, which is the home to the Dakunyung people. As you say, the committee is on the Gadigal lands, and I pay my respects to all these lands and its people. The Office of the Registrar General is responsible for the oversight of the Torrens system of secure property rights in New South Wales. And of course, secure property rights are a hallmark of our economy. A person's title recorded in the registry provides state guaranteed ownership and a secure basis for banks to lend money and for investment and growth. And this makes the economy go round. And maintaining that security is an important factor in any reform, and this one is, is no exception. While the monetization of land title is a foundation of a confident economy. We are inspired by this ancient, much deeper and timeless connection Indigenous people have with land, a meaning beyond the property right itself and an interminable connection with our people and our land. Our principal aim with this bill is a competitive LNO market with, with stronger oversight of e-conveyancing payments that benefit the users of the system and, and our community. This bill is a necessary prerequisite, if you like, to putting detailed arrangements in place via 
national regulations, uh, data standards and the financial industry code needed before rolling out interoperability. This bill is also necessary now to justify the resources needed to complete interoperability. With this bill, existing LNOs must implement interoperability, justifying the commitment and resources this will require. For incoming LNOs, the bill gives investors the confidence needed to resource development and rollout. And for banks and land registries, the bill provides certainty, allowing commitment to any necessary system changes and process changes in their business plans and tech roadmaps. The counterfactual without this bill is these critical organisations will find it much harder to plan confidently in the coming 12 to 24 months. For practitioners, the lawyers and the conveyances, this bill is the first building block to make sure that they have choice in their provider of e-conveyancing services, but they will continue to be able to conduct transactions with practitioners who choose a different provider. The proposed data standard maintains security um, through a set of purpose-built APIs required to be at least as secure as the existing con connections LNOs already have with land registries, revenue offices, banks and the Reserve Bank of Australia. And LNOs will be subject to the same annual independent reviews of those and interoperability connections as they are now. Interoperability by facilitating more than one LNO in this market brings effective competition and that makes LNOs look much more closely at participants' needs in order to compete and earn their customers. We can't predict exactly what new services or products or other improvements competition will bring. However, we do know technology is changing rapidly and that competition creates a market force and energy and incentive to develop new ideas and new solutions to earn and keep customers, which is far more powerful than a monopoly with a mandate for all participants to use its services. However, without this reform, starting with this first bill now, experience has taught us going back to the Hilma reforms in the mid-1990s that monopolies deliver suboptimal outcomes for users in our community. The current implementation timetable tries to balance wide-ranging industry views on the efficient introduction of interoperability. It allows time to finalise the regulations and the data standards, and time to, will be given to satisfy all the necessary ICT assurance reviews, cybersecurity and system readiness tests before interoperability is rolled out. So again, thank you to everyone involved in this reform, particularly the National Industry Panel for your generosity and time, expertise and, and your support and commitment to this reform in the last three to four years. The bill is a recognition of everyone's efforts and an important milestone for all of us along the pathway of sharing the benefits of being conveyancing more widely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I will uh, throw to the opposition for opening the question. Is that you, Mr. Beach? Yes, it's me, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, oh, can I, Mr. Before Primrose. I... Yeah, thank you. Before I begin, can I just say that for the sake of Hansard, um, given the number of acronyms being used, um, I propose to actually simply use the term like rather than saying um, LNO, I'm going to say ELNO when I can remember for the sake of Hansard. Um, um, so I just have one question to begin with and then I'll pass over to Mr Veach and um, it doesn't actually have an acronym in it. Um, can I ask all witnesses, do you believe that an independent regulator appointed by the registrar to assess the readiness of participants and the interoperable system as a whole would help address industry and consumer concerns about cyber security and risk. Uh, Mr. Roberts, did you want to? Yeah, Mr. Roberts, do you want to start that one, and then we'll go down the list. Um, sure. Um, just give me a moment. I have some notes on this on this issue. Look, essentially, uh, the role of an independent regulator of uh, industry uh, is in part already being played uh, played by the uh, ARNIC uh, committee. Uh, essentially, what the committee does is to regulate the electronic conveyancing system. It provides a legal framework for that system. That's comprised in legislation and also in regulations. So essentially, we already have a regulator of the industry the ARNIC role being carried out currently. Um, if you're referring to the creation of an independent expert out, uh, regulator outside of the industry, that is certainly a model that uh, could operate. The problem that we have, though, is that each land registry is headed up by a land registrar who is an independent industry officer and uh, therefore is independent from any other regulator themselves. So any legal regime that would create an independent regulator would then have to deal with the, with the uh, requirements of the regulator in each state and territory to regulate the running of their own systems. Um, I foresee actually some significant legal issues from 
position. E excuse me, Mr. Roberts. Um, I'm, I'm having real trouble hearing you. I notice that I can pick up what you're saying when you're speaking directly into what I assume is your microphone. But maybe if you could do that, please, because I, I think what you're saying is very important. Sure. Uh, so I'll uh, repeat my answer if possible then. So uh, essentially what I'm saying is that uh, currently the ARNIC group is the regulator of ignorant health of electronic conveyancing uh, across the states and territories. Uh, it, it sets up the uh, regulatory uh, uh, platform for the electronic conveyancing system and also each land registrar in each state and territory is an independent statutory officer. As an independent statutory officer, they are they make independent decisions. If we have a third, uh, sorry, a second entity which is overseeing those registrars, then I foresee particular legal issues in relation to fettering the decision making of an independent statutory officer in maintaining the regulatory uh, functions over the electronic surveillance system. Uh, in fact, I would see it as a particularly uh, significant legal issue uh, in trying to get over that. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. That, yeah. that was a lot better. Okay. Thank you. Um, 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 Mr. Cox? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Primrose. Just extending from, um, from Bruce, um, in the absence of um, a separate independent regulator, if you like, in the context of security, um, there's a couple of points to make. One is uh, ARNIC will, before interoperability is rolled out, uh, employ or engage independent assessments of, of ICT security and system readiness. Uh, so there will be uh, a process where ARNIC, which it comprises uh, state and territory representatives, so their registrars from each jurisdiction will determine uh, an appropriately um, independent and um, technically um, able assessment of those things. Um, I suppose my second point um, would be security uh, is critical and paramount, obviously, to the success of interoperability. This reform has been organised around that to the extent to which uh, all industry participants have come together to identify uh, from their perspectives as users of the systems or providers of the systems where risks, security risks exist, uh, and then come up with remedies that have been either apportioned to the regulatory framework or the data specifications or the APIs. On, on the APIs, uh, in terms of the broader issue around making sure interoperability is secure, um, you know, the, the backbone of interoperability is purpose-built APIs that will be governed by a data standard. That data standard will be held within a government-owned entity, which is being set up now, and so the security will be maintained um, and owned um, by uh, government. Uh, and those APIs and the architecture around those APIs uh, will be at a security level um, at, the, at least equivalent to the existing APIs that LNOs have when they connect to banks or registries or revenue offices. Thank you. Ms Cameron? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just, to, just to add slightly to what uh, Mr Roberts and Mr Cox have said, the, the context, so Jeremy's described the security around this project and it's an absolute goal of every, every participant involved in the project. The broader context is an ongoing focus on security within the existing regulatory framework. That includes reporting that, that um, ELNOs need to do themselves as well as ad hoc audits that the ARNEWC commissions from time to time. So it's an ongoing focus of, of every aspect of, um, of, of land titles and ELNOs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll hand over to Mr Veach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so what you're all saying uh, pretty interesting and fascinating. I just have a, a, a concern that um, when it's about to go live, um, as parliamentarian legislators, we're going to enact this. Would you be adverse at all, adverse at, all at um, reporting back to the parliament about um, an overview of security risks and, uh, and the analysis of reliability of the system before we go live? Just so legislators are absolutely that that this is actually good to go live. Sorry, Mr. Veach, we had really trouble hearing you from our end. I don't know whether the witnesses even uh, caught that, but I'm assuming you would, from what I could make out, you were trying to ask whether the witnesses would be prepared to table some technical advice about the security. Is that what you were to Parliament? Is that what you were asking? Yeah, absolutely, Chair. To, to the Parliament just before yeah, they yeah. go live. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat it for the witnesses. So Mr Veach is asking whether uh, you would be prepared to table, I guess, the technical technical advice and, and I guess some of the surety to the parliament before it's about to go live that all these potential cyber security risks are uh, catered for or covered for. Mr Roberts, do you want to start with you? Yes, certainly. I, um, I think that that shouldn't be an issue for us, obviously, as we've indicated, uh, cyber security risks are key for uh, the system and we effort and energy into that and uh, we, so, we see no need, we see uh, that to be something that we can readily easily provide to you. Um, the only comment I would make that in any uh, uh, system we can never uh, anticipate everything, but we've certainly tried to do that in our uh, Thank you. Mr Veach, do you anything, have anything else? Uh, yeah, so one of the other concerns that's being raised, I mean, it's a very real concern um, raised by the Australian Institute of Conveyances, therefore shadow, shadowing that there's a terrifying prospect of home buyers and sellers being stuck on footpaths uh, with all their belongings waiting for the technical fixes between ELN those and registries to be resolved. So what safeguards are we building into the system to avoid this situation? Essentially, we face that risk already. Uh, and so uh, the creation of interoperability is not really creating uh, an, an until necessary risk above, above what we face now. Electronic conveyancing really requires uh, the, the parties to get together online to meet and to essentially assure themselves that the documents that they have created are correct and that financial settlement then occurs. Uh, essentially, this is a risk that we face now, even with the monopoly on pressure. Uh, all we're doing is adding one more uh, ELDO into the transaction and all of our work in terms of the data standards and the system development has been directed towards those uh, LNOs operating safely and securely at the time that they're required to do so. Thanks. Uh, um, that, that's your time, ask, Mr. Veach. Oh, is it? Excellent. Yes, sorry, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I might just pick up there. Um, Mr. Roberts, can I uh, go to you first and talk about I guess the issue of inter LNO fees and, and I guess the pricing structure that's uh, going to be involved in, in this service. My understanding is that Arnet has changed its position several times on on these fees. I'm wondering where are we at now uh, with how the how the fee structure will look. I note that in uh, 14th of July 2021 you 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 suggested that LNO should set their own fees, and then four months later that changed, and then again um, in February 2022, um, it sort of you provide another six options. So where are we at to in terms of fees and prices? Just let's be fair, price is one way that competitors, uh, I guess, differentiate themselves. Yes, thank you. Look, um, uh, pricing currently uh, was the subject of consultation papers, uh, which occurred last year. We put out a number of options to possible pricing regimes. As a result of the feedback that we received uh, from industry on the pricing regime, and in particular from the current uh, PEXA operator, we have agreed to do a further investigation into pricing and pricing principles. We are looking uh, at uh, the potential for the agency to assist us in the development of those pricing principles. Um, if that is not possible, then we will be looking to one of the economic regulators around the country to assist us in developing those pricing principles uh, to establish uh, a mechanism to create a price between internal fees, that is the fees that they can charge each other for electronic conveyance and transactions. Uh, this is quite significant and actually complex work when you're dealing with essentially what is a infrastructure asset um, for the whole country. Uh, getting the pricing right is really important. I'd have to say that members of Arnex's expertise, uh, including myself, is not around economics and pricing. We will need assistance to develop that pricing model. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, do you have anything else? 
Mm. So if, if if we're not settled on pricing as and and we're not really confirmed as to whether uh, the different L nodes will be able to discriminate in price or it'll be a fixed price, how can we truly say there'll be competition when you know essentially the conveyances will be locked into one or one or the other, whether it be hex or simply at the moment, and it may be a fixed price. Um, it's I think in, in with that in mind, I think the the competition argument is a bit of a furphy because there is no real competition, is there? If it's a fixed price and they're all performing the same service, the the the, the end consumer, being the person that's buying the house, doesn't really have competition, do they? In that, if that's the case. Well, Mr. price. Roberts. Is Sorry, price is one element of competition. Competition also is about uh, more than one operator providing the service to the marketplace. So if more than one pro uh, operator provides the services, they can differentiate themselves in terms of the services that they provide to that marketplace. Price is only one differentiator. Perhaps uh, if I could uh, refer to Mr. Cox, to what to do on that response. Y yeah, sure. Thank, thank, thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Chair. And I think the the critical point of clarification here is this is an inter elno fee, um, which is a fee that um, will be determined around how interoperability works. So through an interoperability transaction, the model is such that there will be a responsible elno, and that elno is responsible for lodging uh, transactions and settling trans lodging transactions with registries and settling transactions with the financial institutions. And then there'll be a participant LNO. Um, interoperability means a subscriber can be on any without having to be on both. But the fee between the responsible and participant LNO is an, in, in, an incurred cost by the LNO. It is not necessarily passed on to the subscriber. That's a choice. But the LNOs will still need to compete on prices. So the services they offer to the subscriber is not fixed. Um, so the incoming LNO is offered something like 15 to 20. I can't. Maybe it's best to ask them in terms of their pricing regime compared to the incumbent. But the, well, the fee I, between. I, I, sorry, yeah, sorry, Mr. Cox. I'll just pick up on that. the The data that I've received about that that other fee you're talking about, it works out to be about 0.25 percent of the, the total cost of buying an average home. So we're we're you know we're potentially talking about a difference of four dollars between two competitors, um, uh, potentially. Um, so it's not a, a it's not a great price discriminator. Would you agree? It's very it's very I, I, very sure. discreet. I, I, I would take the view that uh, any reduction in price uh, on property transactions is important, and the agree what you're saying in terms of the con in the scale of a conveyance, which includes property stamp duty, for example. Um, there's a, a, a smaller portion goes to the cost of a title and competing between LNOs. But what the modelling shows is, is if you look at the, the number or volume of transactions that occur in a day or a month or a year, that starts to add up to quite significant savings and net benefits to the economy. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's in the order of 83 million over with MPV with a discount rate of 7% or something, or maybe it's over seven years. But the point is there is a an aggregate saving that comes from part raised is in the absence of competition, price regulation will never get you to the point where savings um, from economies of scale or from digitalization are passed on in the form of a net wealth transfer from the operator to the, to the buyer or the community uh, because um, price regulation is clumsy. Um, it involves some attempt to, to focus on CPI, but the marginal costs go down more quickly in some of these scaled networks. So the, C, so the advice from the ACCC and IPART, which aren't taken on board, is very much um, uh, that the, the um, motivations that come from uh, interoperability because it supports effective competition will be the best driver of all the solutions of downward pressure on prices. Just quickly yeah, to you before, I, yeah, just Sorry. quickly before I go to Miss Boyd, to see which has questions to you, Mr. Cox. How much time has been allowed for banks to get their head around how they might need to change their computer systems because they're not truly interoper interoperable at the moment. They don't interop op with each other. They, a lot of the banks have their own separate systems. Um, so how much time has is, is, is been allowed for them to make the necessary changes from their end so they can be compatible? Because that is another concern that's been raised. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. Um, part of the national industry panel process involves um, 
all industry participants, including banks, um, getting together to raise the issues of concern and then coming up with um, solutions that deal specifically with those. Part of that national interest panel includes an operational uh, implement, sorry, an Im implementation committee, which the banks are part of. And that, um, that is informing, um, that the banks are directly informing the project uh, about the time that they need to roll out uh, um, interoperability. So there's a recognition that the system changes are required uh, and they're part of that consultation process. So at the moment, I, I suppose the key point there is that interoperability is still about 18 months away, that this first bill um, is a, provides some statutory obligation to create certainty, including for the banks, to be able to lock in their roadmaps to say, okay, it is going to happen, and now we need to factor that in. It's the same for the registries. Um, the same issue is in the absence of this bill, it's harder for them to go to their boards and say, we need to lock this in. Um, so that's, um, that's important. But going to your point, uh, they, firstly, they're part of the participatory framework, so they can provide the, the feedback around time. And secondly, they need that certainty through this bill to be able to um, make those plans. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ford, do you have any uh, questions? I certainly do. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and, uh, and good morning to you all. I think this is probably a question um, best directed to you, Mr. Cox. Um, I'm interested in, there's, there's been this, um, as uh, Mr. Benastiak was saying, there has been some concerns around the financial transactions aspect. And the um, my understanding at the moment is that with the Torrens Assurance Fund, if someone was to lose money in a transaction that was directly with the registrar, that they would be covered by that. When there's interoperability put in place and there are transactions or, or money transferred between um, these entities, will, will that then also be covered by the Torrens Assurance Fund? Um, not specifically because the Torrens Assurance Fund covers um, property registered on the, on the New South Wales Registry, in, in our case in New South Wales, but equally for all other states and territories, and, and the government uh, backs that through the Torrens Assurance Fund. So if, if a, re a registered pro pro property is, um, is, is um, registered in error or suffers from some sort of fraudulent um, um, uh, exercise in which the property is transferred unlawfully to somebody else, the state government will back that through the Torrens Assurance Fund. In so far as the financial settlement, that happens through the ELNO outside of that process. But but there are a couple of really important points. Financial settlement and the exact scenario you, you, you've raised has been an issue outside of interoperability. It was raised in the intergovernmental agreement review a few years back as a part of a, a gap in regulation. So as a result, ARNIC did bring together and uh, really helpfully um, drew um, on the advice from the Council of Federal Financial Relations, the APRA, ASICS, etc., RBA, to come up with a, um, a, a, uh, and agree with the LNOs, uh, and it's a really positive outcome of this reform, it is to agree uh, that, that to set up through OzPayNets an industry code uh, which will have a series of conditions to which LNOs need to comply with, and one of them goes to um, tracking and resolving misapplied or unapplied funds. Uh, that obviously applies for interoperability, but it also applies for the scenario you painted now, which can occur and, and, and is, is critical. So this, what this bill does is it provides that statutory obligation for LNOs to sign up to that industry code, or at least it, it requires that through regulations. So that, that's a really important um, development. The other consumer protection I think that's worth raising um, is around um, the means by which LNOs are required to monitor, audit, report, follow transactions um, through an interoperable um, arrangement. Um, I know a concern that has been raised, as you do and others, is will I lose sight of um, you know, my transaction, given it's now going through a couple of LNOs. So certainly, um, there's a, really, a couple of really important points to, to, to make. F firstly, um, there is a, um, going to be a requirement on, on LNOs to come up with an agreement um, that involves uh, a requirement on both of them, to, or all of them, um, depending how many evolve. Uh, cooperate in the investigation and resolution of any complaints. Um, they have to have a process to, to, to uh, have a timely rectification, if you like, um, of any failure affecting interoperability, and that includes a, a root cause analysis. So that goes to the scenario of misapplied or where, where have my funds gone. And I think finally, um, a, a really important point to make too, which is a, a broader issue around consumer protection, is around privacy. Um, so LNOs are required to um, maintain their cloud systems in Australia, and that means they are subject to Australian privacy laws, and interoperability is no different to that too. 
Um, so these are really important points around consumer protection, around financial strengthening financial regulation, and around security of of the interoperability regime. Um, and again, just to, to finish on the way we've come at this is to bring all the industry experts, and it'd be really worth raising with the other industry representative, representatives to make sure that they're satisfied with the process. But what we've tried to do is bring them all into the room, identify from their perspectives where are the risks, and then let's let's move them from the abstract to the real and identify remedies. If it's in the regulations, we'll put it in the regulations. If it's in the data standards, we'll build the data standards to um, be able to check. Yeah. So, so just to Sorry, Ms. Boyd. That, mm. Sorry, Ms. Boyd. That, it's all right. That, that, that answer took a long while. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry about that. That took too long. Yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, does, the, does the government have any questions at all? If it's government time, happy to cede to um, back to Abigail on the crossbench to continue that line of questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martin. Ms. Boyd, do you want to continue with that clarification then? I, yeah, I do. Thank you so much. So that's really useful to hear about the consumer protections around the, um, the financial settlement aspects. But in terms of having a backstop assurance fund, where if it all goes wrong and for whatever reason someone does lose money, is there, it does the, the current regulation or, or is there anything anywhere that will provide that assurance for people to draw on? That, that doesn't exist in, in the current regime, um, but the accountabilities through um, the financial settlement code, the, the self industry code, will go much more clearly clearly to those accountabilities, um, where there's a transition of, of financial, um, of the movement of finances through payments and property, uh, who's accountable for what and tracking those. Um, and so then it, come, it will come to those organisations involved in that transaction that are responsible for, for that financial side. But that's not, not a separate Torrens Assurance Fund um, or, or the like for, the, for that financial settlement and, and transaction is, is not envisaged. This, this reform or for e conveyancing more generally. Thank you, that's really useful. Ms. Cameron, did you want to add something there? Thanks, Ms. Boyd. So I think um, it, there's also an issue between <coughs> state and Commonwealth regulation here because oversight of banks and financial systems sits with the Commonwealth, with ASIC APRA, you know, the RBA is also involved. And so um, essentially the, 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 the kinds of questions about insurance fund would probably sit more within that jurisdiction. And so the, the beauty of the industry code is it kind of, it, it brings enough of um, oversight of financial regulation into what registrars can see, but they're not responsible for it. It's a self-regulatory code. So it's, a, it's the, the, the best outcome that we could achieve working with those Commonwealth regulators. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martin, do you have some questions? Yes, uh, I'll start with Mr. Roberts. Um, could you just give us a bit of an overview as to the governance of ARNEC and particularly who ARNEC's accountable to? Uh, certainly. So um, essentially the governance model is that we have the Australian Rules Trust, uh, National Council. Uh, all Australian Rules Trust report to their respective ministers uh, themselves. Uh, underneath uh, the Australian Registrar's uh, Council, we have uh, the various committees, uh, the implementation committees and the technical committees that are made up of not only members of government and registrars and the technical experts, but also key uh, industry participants across the whole spectrum of electronic advancing. I mean, I think the fundamental thing uh, around the governance model is a collaborative approach that we've adopted over the last three to four years in order to bring pass this uh, legislative regime and this system. So essentially we have the, these committees uh, essentially reporting to, to ARNIC and then ARNIC then reporting to the Instagram ministers through the Instagram registrar. And could you give us just a bit of an idea as to which other government agencies ARNIC primarily work with already and which ones they will be working with going through this process? Sure. So I think we've mentioned uh, in relation to financial settlement, we've been working with key uh, organisations such as the ACC. Uh, we're also working with uh, uh, treasuries in each uh, each jurisdiction. 
and have our own, each own central government agencies as well. So, uh, for example, in the Grace case, it's not only Treasury but our Department of Finance as well. Um, the uh, at the national level, although uh, they're not regulated in the sense of electronic conveyancing, um, the Reserve Bank of Australia is a key participant. We're working with and that, of course, is involved in the netting of the funds between the owners when settlement transactions occur. Uh, we're also working uh, uh, with other key bodies in uh, states and territories that regulate um, uh, people in the marketplace. So, for example, in the case of um, settlement agents and lawyers, we're working with the um, Council of Australia and with settlement agents, we're working with the Australian Institute of Conveyances. Uh, to bring them essentially along on the journey uh, uh, themselves. I wonder if I could throw to Jeremy in terms of other regulators. If I've missed any, Jeremy. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. Unless Mr. Talley, if there's anything further on that question, I can add. No, no, all good. And look, it's my understanding that PECSA is currently not attending the workshop groups to design the tech for interoperability. Um, and they've not in fact attended since uh, the back, uh, back half, back quarter of last year. What's Arnick doing to get PEXA back to the table for that particular part of the reform? Um, yes, thank you. Look, uh, PEXA has uh, raised a number of issues uh, uh, in relation to the reform and Arnick has described how to address each of those issues. So the first one is their concerns around our amendments to the uh, legislation. The amendment to the uh, really part of the staged approach uh, and process and the ministers from all jurisdictions have effectively agreed to support uh, those additional uh, amendments to the legislation to, and to further engage with stakeholders in relation to the comments on the draft bill. On the question of pricing, Arnic has indicated it will be engaging the economic regulator to do the pricing. On the questions around timetable that PEXA has raised, this has really been about balancing the need for competition and for elbows to design and build uh, the systems. Uh, so the solution, I think, as we mentioned earlier, not go live unless we are assured that um, issues around uh, security um, have been satisfied and capability have also been satisfied. Um, on uh, PEXA has also raised the role of ARNIC in this whole reform. Essentially, what we will do is to continue to work with the industry, including PECSA, on finalising the legal documents that are setting up uh, the data standards for uh, the system. We've actually incorporated a company which is essentially owned by all states and territories uh, to issue licences to LMOs for those key data standards. So, really, ANIC has adopted the consistent position that. All of the issues that PECSA have raised, both now and through the last three or four years, is something that can be addressed concurrently and collaboratively in developing the reform. The reform gives us sufficient flexibility to do that. We have sufficient time, in other words, to do that. While PECSA has said that not, not all of these issues need to be settled before they return, it is true that it's not clear when they will return to the table and this is an ongoing ambiguity which for us is uh, not only for us but also for, for industry. So um, essentially without the ability to uh, enforce interoperability which we which will be in the second set of amendments, it is difficult for ARNEC to bring PEXA to the table in a, in a mandatory way you know, if they choose not to participate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roberts. That is the government's time and uh, our time with all three of you. So thank you very much for uh, coming to us virtually and, and providing uh, that information. It was uh, very much appreciated. Um, we will now uh, bid you farewell and uh, go through and bring in our next lot of witnesses. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, we should now have with us uh, representatives from the Law Council uh, of Australia, uh, the Chair of the National E-Conveyancing System Committee, uh, and 
also the Law Society of New South Wales. Um, so I welcome to you all, um, so we can catch up on some time. Can I ask that each witness state their name, position, title, and swear either an oath or affirmation, uh, starting with Mr. Liveris. Uh, good morning, Chair. My name is Tass Liveris. I am the President of the Law Council of Australia, and I will I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Argy? Or Argy? Ms. Uh, you might be on mute. Thank you. Um, I think somebody else is controlling my mute. Um, my name is Philip Argy and I chair the National Electronic Conveyancing System Committee of the Law Council of Australia. And I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr Farrell? Uh, John Farrell, I'm a senior policy lawyer at the Law Council of Australia, and I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And Mr. Harvey? Yes, uh, I'm Richard Harvey. I'm the chair of the Law Society of New South Wales Property Law Committee, and I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Thank you. Now, in the same order, would anyone like to make a short opening statement? And if you could keep it to one or two minutes, that'd be great. So, thank you, Chair. Uh, so someone from the Law Council? Yes, thank you, Chair. We have a reasonably short opening statement. I will run through. Uh, the Law Council of Australia welcomes the opportunity to appear before this committee. The bill proposes amendments to the Electronic Conveyancing National Law, which provides the legislative underpinning of the national scheme for the electronic settlement and lodgement of conveyancing transactions. In particular, the bill proposes amendments to the ECNL to require interoperability between electronic lodgement network operators we call ELNOs. The Law Council strongly supports competition between ELNOs and considers interoperability to be a critical feature of the future of the e-conveyancing market. In the Law Council's view, competition in this market will drive innovation for improved products and services for users and increase downward pressure on prices. It will ensure that members of the legal profession have a choice as to which ELNO is best for them and will mean that they are not required to be signed up to multiple ELNOs. The Law Council is broadly supportive of the amendments proposed in the bill. The introduction of this bill is an important step in the process towards interoperability. It is also an indication to the sector that progress is being made towards the important goal of interoperability. Although further amendments as set out in the attachment to the Law Council submission will be required to the national law before interoperability is fully achieved in 2023, the passage of the bill in its present form reflects an urgent imperative to legislatively mandate interoperability. This is, a nece this is necessary to signal to the market that investments in interoperability will not be futile. It's important to note that the bill is not only an initiative of the New South Wales government, but is the considered outcome of the deliberations of the Australian Registrar's National Electronic Conveyancing Council, as well as by the relevant ministers from each state and territory. Against this background, scrutiny by the New South Wales Parliament should be approached with great care, as any amendments proposed would need to be agreed at multiple national levels. It is the Law Council's view that any concerns with the bill and or the national law ought to be addressed in the next bill that is already foreshadowed by ARNIC and the Joint Ministers. The Law Council welcomes the Joint Minister's commitment to progressing further reforms to the national law and looks forward to participating in the ongoing consultation process. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. We are happy to answer questions. Thank you. Mr Harvey, did you have a short opening statement? You just on mute, Mr Harvey. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Largely, we, we support the view of the Law Council, to, uh, which, of course, is the organisation of which we are a constituent member. The Law Society's position is we've long supported the and the introduction of interoperability, the 
between ELMO. Uh, we have over a considerable period of time contributed to consultation uh, to deliver the reform, and we recognise that the bill is a necessary step in implementing interoperability. Interoperability will provide our members with the ability to conduct conveyance and transactions using the ELMO of their choosing without the need to subscribe to every ELMO that may enter the market. Our submission indicates to the inquiry our high level concerns, however, that remain to be addressed. Two levels of those. The first thing is that the, the proposed members of the ECNL may not sufficiently address the wide and varied components of interoperable transactions, particularly financial settlement of interoperable transactions. The regulation of financial settlement must be included as part of the revised regulatory framework for interoperability. This is a significant change required to the underlying approach of the bill and requires a number of technical amendments. The second thing is the bill provides the registrars with the powers to make uh, model operating requirements regarding the resolution of disputes between an ELMA and subscribers or their clients. Where funds are misapplied, for example, a clear framework for the resolution of claims and disputes accessible by subscribers is crucial. Given the proposed industry code operates between ELMOs and financial institutions only, the new power has an important role to play in enabling clarification of a subscriber's ability on behalf of their clients to access claims and dispute processes. And we look forward to further detail of being provided on this, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I will pass to Mr Primrose from the opposition for, to start off the questions. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This is a... Um a preliminary question to all witnesses, but I might begin by asking um, Mr. Liveris if he can. Um, do you believe an independent regulator appointed by the registrar to assess the readiness of participants and the interoperable system as a whole would help address industry and consumer concerns about cyber security and risk? Uh, Councillor, our, the important issue with this bill is that it introduces interoperability into the primary legislation. That is the critical objective of the bill and that is what must take primacy in the committee's deliberations. The other aspects of the bill that have been the subject of submissions by various stakeholders that suggest require further deliberation can be dealt with in the second and third and multiple stages of reforms that the ministers have jointly referred to. But it's extremely important that the focus of this bill be disciplined to what it is intended to achieve, and that is to introduce interoperability into the primary legislation and make it functional in 2023. And that is a key objective. It's not only a good objective, but it's a necessary objective and it's extremely important that we not lose sight of that in our discussions. Would an independent regulator assist that? We suggest that those types of issues can be considered in the, in the next stages of reforms. At the moment, this bill focuses on establishing interoperability. And so the, the, the types of discussions that might that might revolve around the, the, the particular question you asked, Councillor, are matters that we think can be dealt with down the, down the line. Thank you. Um, any other views from other witnesses, please? Uh, Philip Argy, Mr Primrose, perhaps I might just supplement what uh, President Liveris has said by indicating that I think in, over the course of the next year, ARNIC, uh, will equip itself with some additional technical expertise which will assist it to be the regulator as it currently is. Okay. Um, okay, I might move on to my next question if no other witnesses have any comments. Okay. Um, do you hold concerns over um, ELNO, that's for Hansard, ELNO's offering services such as information searches Broking services and specific conveyancing software solution and lodgement services. Maybe beginning with Mr. Liveris again, please. Um, Councillor, the, the, the analogy that best fit with, in my mind, about what interoperability means relates to telecommunications companies. It's like 
Telstra and Optus customers being able to phone each other. And so what, what this means is that for legal practices, well, apart from the consumer benefits that, as I said in the, at the beginning, the driving of innovation, the increased competition, improving products, providing consumers with that choice and enhancing that framework, is that it, it means that legal practices won't have to be subscribing to multiple LNOs and there will be direct and indirect cost savings that will flow to that. Oftentimes, those cost savings will therefore mean that they're not passed to the consumer. But it's like suggesting that uh, in order to, for a Telstra customer to find an Optus customer, they have to subscribe to both. And this is what this bill will eliminate, will be the requirement to subscribe to multiple LNOs. Now that, as I said, and I, it is important to reinforce, needs to be the focus of the committee's deliberations because that is what this bill will introduce into the primary legislation, into operability. Okay, anyone else? Uh, yeah, and yes, Councillor, I, I, I think that the, the issue of vertical integration is something which has been considered by the professions uh, over a period of time. But uh, as uh, the other witnesses have said, it's, this bill is not the place for that discussion to be had. Okay. Um, now, I note that the Law Council mentioned in their letter of support to the Minister a number of concerns you've raised about ARNEC um, for Hansard ARNEC. Uh, can you detail these concerns, please? Commissioner, we've raised um, issues that we think require scrutiny in the next stages of uh, consultation and amendment that the ministerial statement has foreshadowed using terms the ministers recognise that the reform is complex and may require multiple regulatory amendments. I'm reading from the joint ministerial statement of 28 January 2022, and that the ministers will meet again uh, to in coincide with the introduction of the first set of amendments. So we welcome that further set of amendments are foreshadowed. Um, so the, the points that we've made, uh, it needs to be emphasised, do not impede our primary position that the bill in its current form should pass. We simply suggest that matters such as definitions, some of them pre-existing in the primary law already, I might add, some of them new definitions, and some of them certain limits or ambiguities on the liability of registrars and things of that sort can be and should be refined, but they are matters that are appropriately dealt with in the next stages of reform. They are not matters that we suggest for a moment justify an impediment to the passage of the bill. Indeed, we aren't aware of any issue raised during the discussion process in relation to this bill that ought justify it being delayed. Any other views? Comments? I just support what President Liver has said. Okay. It's the end of my questions. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Veach, do you have any questions? Just, just the one chair. I hope I'm coming through okay this time. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Um, uh, it's been been suggested that there may be it may be worthwhile and beneficial to the Parliament if the RG was to um, provide a, a statement, essentially clarify a statement that would clarify or provide certainty to the legislators that uh, all risks have been um, put in have been uh, assessed. Um, and um, uh, prior to going live, what, what what the views of both on that, Councillor? We don't we don't take a view on that, other than to reaffirm my evidence already given, and that is that we've we've scrutinised this bill in its current form, and we think it should pass. We've footnoted that with some matters that need attention in the next stages of reforms. They are important, but they don't justify delaying the bill. 
uh, and we will look forward to being involved in further rounds of consultation and amendment as the ministers may see fit. That's it, Mr. Uh, that's Edge. It. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, I might just start off. I only really probably have one question because I think opposition has covered uh, the other part. Mr. Liberus, you, you stated in your previous answer to Mr. Primrose that this first bill is about setting up the stages and I guess setting up interop interoperability. Um, but is it not true that the other potential competitor in this market simply has already had the ability to provide these services, but has chosen not to. Um, so is, is this bill really truly integral to providing that competition with simply, um, or, you know, I, I'm trying to get what, what is, what is the, the hurdle that is stopping simply from providing these services already? Cause they do, my understanding is they have that facility, um, but they've just chosen not to. So is there something specifically in the, in the legal framework that is stopping them from providing that service at this point in time? Well, the, the issue is, is that at currently uh, it requires um, subscribers to, uh, participants to subscribe to multiple Elnos. And, and as I said earlier, the best analogy in my mind is as between telecommunications companies. If you're a Telstra customer, you can ring an Optus phone without having to also subscribe to Optus. Now, what interoperability will do requires the um, Elnos to communicate with one another, and it then provides that ability for consumers, subscribers, to not have to subscribe to multiple Elnos. What that will then do broadly and why it is so critical is because it will increase competition, it will promote innovation, it will enhance services for users, it will um, result in uh, a better, cheaper products. It's ultimately about choice. And that is what is lacking at the moment. And that is what interoperability at its core will achieve. So it's more of, well, if I just clarify, it's more about the convenience of having to, not having to sign up to two, two Elmos, and, uh, and that's what creates that choice. Well, it's, it's, it's more, more about than, convenient, convenience to the end user. Is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, that's a part of it, but with respect, that is not it only. It, it is more than just something, a matter of convenience. It is a matter of cost. It is a matter of increased competition. It is a matter of... Uh, incentives to drive innovation to improve products so it is it is it would be it would be incomplete to suggest that this bill is simply about convenience because it is much more multi multifaceted than that mm. hey, you might not be the right people to talk about the innovation because that is no, you know it's been touted by a few submissions but are you aware of what specific innovations will come from this at all or is it when you talk about innovation, is that just a blanket statement that you're not too sure where where that innovation will come from? I'm not. I'm not going to speculate about that. Yeah. Um, I I don't know whether Mr. Argy or Mr. Harvey wish to say anything more about it. Uh, look, Mr. Chairman, I, I, if I could perhaps just add this, um, in in response to your two two questions. Um, obviously, you need to speak to Simply, and I gather they are yeah. appearing before the committee later on. Um, yeah. My understanding is that at the moment, of course, interoperability is not in place, so Simply can't offer the full range of services. What they're doing at the moment is doing proof of concept for some selected transactions, which are the most common transactions. So uh, my understanding is they will be 100% offering of the same range of transactions as PEXA offers when interoperability is implemented uh, early next year. So that, that's part one. Part two, the kind of innovation we're talking about, and this is really important, um, are things like usability. So, for example, the committee is using WebEx. Um, you know that people have the option of Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams. 
and they each offer slightly different features, slightly different benefits, but that competition is really healthy. And as we've seen over the past few years, there's been massive strides in the innovation that have been brought to bear in how these systems work. And, and what the advantage of competition is going to be is that particularly for uh, lawyers that don't do day in, day out conveyancing, infrequent users really need much more user friendly interfaces and, and competition offers the strong likelihood that those users will be much better catered for uh, than the current system, which is really geared to people who eat, sleep and breathe conveyancing every day. Okay, thank you. I might just pass to Ms Boyd um, if see that she has any questions. Uh, before, I, I, I actually would... Oh, sorry. No, no, absolutely. Chime on, on this issue. Without interoperability, if there's two competitors or more, then there's going to be a question of uh, then the, the transaction can only be completed on one of those L nodes. So think in a conveyancing transaction, I'm acting for the vendor, you're acting for the purchaser, I'm on Simply, you're on PEXA. Who determines which of those networks is going to be used? Because without interoperability, you can only use one of them. So you're going to end up with this ridiculous contractual impasse between two different practitioners saying, no, no, I'm on Simply, you must use Simply. And the first say, no, no, I'm on PEXA, we have to use PEXA. Without interoperability, you're going to have that very basic problem. It really just wouldn't work without interoperability. Okay, thank you, Mr. Harvey. That's that, that's a really good analogy. Um, Ms. Boyd. Thank you, um, and good morning to you all. I um, I guess when we're looking at this reform, we're looking at this initial bill, which is kind of setting out the, or I guess giving the um, the green light for it all to go ahead. And then as you've detailed, we're then looking at a series of um, further sort of uh, discussions and um, amendments and considerations that then will lead us to the final thing um, down the track. But if we don't do this bit, then we don't get to do the whole process. That's my understanding of what's happening here. But I guess from a, um, a consumer perspective or from the perspective of anybody who has perhaps lost a bit of trust in government to do what they say that they're going to do, um, there is some concern that perhaps those further amendments won't go the way that people want them to, to go. Is there anything from a legal perspective you think we could do to amend the bill in a way that would give that assurance? So for example, some sort of review provision that, that states that if you don't get to a certain milestones within a certain time, then perhaps it's it can be um, changed again. Or it, do you have any ideas around how we can give that assurance to people? Councillor, I, I strongly caution against an approach that seeks to um, amend the bill at this point. Uh, primarily and fundamentally, what this will do will amend the primary legislation to introduce interoperability. As I say, that is not just an important step, but it's a necessary step. It will also, as I said in my opening, be a very strong indicator to the market that we're making progress here and that investment in the sector is not futile. The additional complication, and I suggest the basis for the committee to proceed with particular caution in terms of uh, further amendments is that as this product is not, as this bill is not a uh, sole initiative of the New South Wales Parliament, as it comes out of the um, years long deliberations of ARNEC and all of the state and territory governments, amendments would not only need to be agreed at a multi-governmental level, but the process becomes considerably unwieldy. And so where the joint ministers have indicated and recognised that the reform is complex, but that interoperability is a critical step in the process, which it of course is, and I, I, I labour the point, it's not critical, not only critical, it's necessary. Um, we we receive the joint ministerial statement that talks about the possibility of re multiple regulatory amendments and referring to this as a first set of amendments as an indication that we can look down the track 
at the certain types of issues that we've and other stakeholders have foreshadowed, but it's important not to lose sight of what this bill is designed to do and the imperative that it pass in its current form. So perhaps I could just clarify then, and then I will invite um, the other witnesses to give their contribution. I think I, my suggestion was not that we amend the, the core bill. The suggestion was that we add on perhaps something to give people assurance. And perhaps the answer is that there is nothing that can give people assurance that the next steps will be taken in good faith. Um, you know, a, a review provision is not unusual. An amendment in the Legislative Council would not unduly delay the bill. Um, I understand what you're saying about um, amending core aspects of, of the bill and how that needs to be considered at a, a sort of multi-jurisdictional level. Um, but in terms of building in a safeguard, I guess, for the, the sort of democratic process, um, in order to, to make people feel more comfortable, is there anything you can conceive of that might do that in terms of um, an addition to the bill? Um, Councillor, I don't have any uh, additional remarks to make to that question. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Harvey? Councillor, I, I think what I'd say on that is that we think the bill should go through as is, because there's, in terms of the, the democratic process and goodwill and will people do the right thing, the processes that certainly the Law Society of New South Wales, the Law Council of Australia, you know, the Registrar General, Land Registry Services, the ABA, everyone has been working on this very, very assiduously. There's a real desire for it to work. And and, and what, whilst we had some concerns, which I mentioned in my opening remarks uh, on certain areas, we know those are the matters which the Ministerial State indicate are things that are going to be discussed. And, and a lot of the things that many of the submissions of raised will be dealt with in the model operating requirements and that's a thing which the registrars australia wide will regulate control um we just think i, I just in terms of that we've found that the whole process has been very cooperative and that all of the major stakeholders work together and we, we we have an appreciation that the things that need to be done will be discussed so that the, in the next layer of legislation not the act itself those things will be attended to. Thank, um, thank you. I add my two pennies worth, um, Ms Boyd, because I think it's, it's ironical that our comfort level that these things will happen comes from the unanimity across all political parties, all states and territories. We, we have a really rare unanimous statement from all of the stakeholders that this is going to happen. And uh, I, I really get a lot of comfort from that, that's pretty unusual to get everybody cross-party, cross-jurisdictional, unanimously agreeing that these further consultations and uh, amendments are, go are going to happen. So um, I, I would respectfully say we actually get our comfort level from the nature of the process. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll throw to the uh, government for any questions. Chair, I only have one question, so if there's time at the end of that to go back to what Ms Boyd was talking about, I'm happy with that. Um, Mr Liveris in particular, but I guess anyone, um, you have mentioned in your opening statement about the urgency of this. Um, can you just touch on that a little bit more and why the time frame is so important? The, the time frame is so important because this has been, as we've discussed, a very long time coming and it has come out of the considered deliberations that have been years long between ARNEC, between key stakeholders and between all state territory governments. And the process towards interoperability being achieved in 2023 will be, this is a critical step in that process. It, it is a critical step in what is um, a, 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 a considered but complex reform and so, so that we can achieve that basic, um, uh, that basic feature of interoperability in the system that has been hamstrung without it, uh, that is what makes this bill so important. And is, it is what makes it, as I've said, not only good, but necessary. Thank you. 
So if we if we delay this this bill and we miss that 2023 time frame, what are, so I guess what are some of the practical ramifications of that? Well, the 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 the, the major ramification of it is that if the, if uh, is that interoperability will not be achieved, or it will not be achieved within the existing expected time frame, and that and that and that would uh, that would be a, that would not be a good outcome because. As I said, we've spoken about all the benefits that the features of interoperability will have on the market, on consumers, on legal practices, on investment, on on all those types of things. As I said earlier to the, I think to the chair, it's not, it's not. This is not simply about convenience. This is uh, uh, critical, and we will lose that opportunity if, if. The passage towards interoperability is not um, is not facilitated, and this opportunity is not taken. I'm happy with that, Chair. If you wanted to go back to to Miss Boyd, okay. Miss Miss Boyd, do you have any other questions? Um, I guess along the same lines as as prior, I just want to test that a little bit more. Um, so, an example of the type of provision that we could add um, at the end of the bill would be something along the lines of within 12 months, the Registrar General will report to the, the Parliament or a particular committee um, to give an update uh, in relation to the, um, you know, the, the, the process or some something of that nature, which is not actually messing with the terms of the bill, but is giving that parliamentary oversight and that assurance um, that the future reforms uh, will actually occur as they're planned to. Do you see any objection to that, is there any? What do you, I guess? Do you have a problem with that idea, yeah, Councillor? This is. Uh, um, I reaffirm my initial answer, and and that is that in its current form, this bill should pass. I'm not. I think I appreciate the sentiment that you are expressing, Councillor, but I am not in a position to just start to discuss. Um, additions or amendments to the bill in this hearing, what it is incredibly important to re-emphasise is the imperative of interoperability being achieved and the remarks made by my colleagues, Mr. RG and Mr. Harvey, that supplemented the depth of the considered process and collaborative effort that has got us to this point. And my overarching concern, despite what you say, councillor, about it being a um, perhaps less controversial or insubstantial amendment, is, is that amendments of any sort run the serious risk, I would have thought, as a broad statement, not a specific one, but in general statement, of delay. And we strongly caution against delay for the reasons that we've set out. It is very important that we continue on the path towards achieving interoperability in 2023. Understood. Um, and I guess for your benefit, Mr. Liveris, we commonly amend, I mean, as you must know, we commonly amend uh, legislation um, in the Legislative Council in order to, to compromise amongst, you know, competing interests um, just to get the job done. And sometimes it can result in less delay than more delay. If there was no delay caused, just let's let's just be hypothetical and say that the amendment would cause no delay. Do you have um, a concern with that sort of provision being added um, to the end of the bill? My fundamental concern, well, one of my fundamental concerns is delay. Um, if if we're speculating or if we're talking in purely hypothetical terms, councillor, and someone said to me, I've I want to add. A, I want to add something there. It will not. It will not interfere with the time. With the time frame that that resolves an aspect of of my concern. Um, uh, without analysing the detail of exactly what that what that addition is, um, but I, I really. I as I said. I I understand and appreciate the sentiment. But I must emphasise that yeah, in its current form, there is this bill or pass, and and that is our primary focus. May I ask a question, just just following on from that? Um, um, this bill was due to be passed 12 months ago. I mean, the delay has already occurred. Um, 
the suggestion um, from Ms Boyd, and I made a similar suggestion earlier as well, was to enable a provision simply for some oversight. That may assist the delay not occurring. Um, um, would you support then a proposal that simply said that there was some degree of oversight? Um, that, 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 that very much may have um, the ability to not um, allow when you're developing the next round of regulatory oversight legislation for it, act, for it not to be delayed again for a further 12 months. Councillor, I think the, the, the point you raise um, reflects why, why the imperative is growing. It's, it's, this, this reform has already suffered some delay. We, it has already but not because up. of parliamentary matters. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting yeah. that that yeah. is the cause of it. But what I am suggesting is that this bill has been a long time coming. And it is very important that that then be the focus and that we look at achieving this outcome as a critical step in the process towards achieving full interoperability, uh, which will still which will still take until next year to um, to be in place. Um, I, I suggest that that is the critical focus of the committee's work um, rather than the types of um, perhaps if I could describe them as 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 intended safeguards that that you are you, um, you are talking about this morning that uh, is a quite a separate thing to whether this bill which, which the law council has analyzed um, is a good bill that should pass and it is supplement that, that's fine yeah okay um and, and really answer both Mr. Primrose and, and Ms. Boyd by, by noting that the electronic conveyancing national law is uh, a, a very, very unusual animal. Um, whilst the New South Wales Parliament has been chosen as, as the, uh, if you like, the mechanical vehicle through which uh, its provisions are enacted, other states and territories automatically adopt those changes. And so the intergovernmental agreement, which has resulted in this national law, re requires that every word, if not every comma, in a bill be uh, discussed and approved by each of the jurisdictions. And so the difficulty with what is proposed is, is that the New South Wales government and parliament, in, in a strict sense, whilst it obviously technically has autonomy, um, it, it should, as a matter of comity, I would respectfully suggest, not interfere with the words, because to change one word of the bill would require it to go back to each of the eight states and territories um, and have that change approved. And that would take a long time, and that's our great fear. That so, that Mr Archie, just... even though it's been delayed by 12 months already, um, your suggestion is that the New South Wales Parliament may get in the way. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it that disrespectfully. I'll simply note that the mechanics of achieving the agreement that has resulted in the language in this bill has taken longer than expected. And so, what that really does is illustrate the risk of seeking to go back through that process to change any word of the bill. Can I just clarify that? Chair, is that all right? I just yeah, that's fine. I, I, I completely understand what you're saying in terms of the language of the provisions that are already there, and they are the operative provisions that are putting in place the scheme that we're talking about. But if we also wanted to add, in order for the Legislative Council to be comfortable with passing the bill, we also wanted to add an entirely separate provision, which is very common for us to do, with either a review or a reporting mechanism or, or something like that. I don't see how that provision would then need to be considered as part of the model bill for your purposes. Are you saying that if we did that, then somehow that that amendment in itself would need to go back through this process, even though it doesn't interrupt the amendments and the operative provisions that have been proposed in the bill? Uh, my understanding is that if what you seek to do is to change the words of the bill itself, 
that would be the case if if you're talking about a different resolution a procedural resolution of some other kind i i can't really comment um the the imperative from our point of view to overcome the fear of not having interoperability ready for the beginning of next year is that anything at all happens that would delay passage of this bill that's the bottom line at the risk of laboring the point Thank you. That that takes us right on time. Um, so I thank you all for your uh, evidence you've given today, um, and we'll now bid you farewell and bring in our next set of witnesses. So thank you all. Thank you. Chair. Okay, we now should have uh, representatives from the Australian Banking Association and also the Australian Institute of Conveyances, uh, noting that we have a slight change in our witness list um, with uh, Mr. Dale Turner replacing uh, Miss Michelle Kent. So starting with uh, you, Mr. Turner, can you state your name, position title, and swear either an oath or affirmation, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and uh, Councillors. My name is Dale Turner. I'm a councillor of the Australian Institute of Conveyances, and I swear that the evidence now given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, and we should also have Miss Hendrew. Thank you, Chair. Michelle Hendry, Vice President of the Australian Institute of Conveyances, and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And we'll now go to uh, Ms Landis. Good morning. I'm Fiona Landis, Executive Director Policy, Australian Banking Association. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. And uh, Mr Harper. Yes, Brendan Harper, uh, Policy Director of Australian Banking Association. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Now, would either of you like to make a short opening statement, um, starting back with uh, the Australian Institute of Conveyances? And if you can keep it to a, a minute or two minutes, that'd be great. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Chair. Um, the AIC, thank you for the opportunity to provide a submission on and attend today's inquiry into the amendment bill. It was a necessity for the conveyancing and legal industries and those associated to be digitally transformed and evidently have done so successfully. However, with such digital transformation evolved a regulatory framework lacking clarity for competition and interoperability. E-conveyancing or an ELM is now a fundamental tool to deliver conveyancing services to consumers, which for many are selling or purchasing one of their most important financial investments of their life. Nationally, conveyances lodge a significant number of real tra property transfers with that number only continuing to grow. The AIC supports competition and considers interoperability essential to enable true competition in the ELM marketplace. However, the implementation of interoperability is complex and is a first time project, which demands a new regulatory framework to ensure the protection of consumer assets, which often represent a lifetime of work and savings, and is rigorous safeguards public confidence in e-conveyancing and the integrity of the land registries. The current bill, in our view, does not address the significant issues raised during the extensive consultation to date. Our key concerns are financial settlement, resolution of claims and disputes, an enforcement regime, compliance, cost, and importantly to both conveyances and consumers, the ability for vertical integration, and Elno competing with conveyances and lawyers, their subscribers, by providing end-to-end -end services. As warned by the ACCC, vertical integration would be anti-competitive and contrary to the public's interest. Lastly, we acknowledge the ministerial statement on 28 January 2022, indicating the intent to consider the issues raised during consultation separately at a later date. Perhaps during this discourse and examination by the committee of the bill, 
some of these issues may be resolved or better explained than they have been to date. However, there are issues such as those above, which have been expressed by not only the ARC, but also others as key areas of concern. And in that respect, we question, is the bill not putting the cart before the horse? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any, any opening statement from the um, Banking Association? Yes, thank you. Good morning. The ABA represents Australia's major banks, regional and international banks. The ABA develops policy and advocacy on behalf of our members, advocating for a strong, competitive and innovative banking industry that delivers fair outcomes for customers. In this context, e-conveyancing is a very important aspect of the broader banking ecosystem in that it helps facilitate everyday Australians, mums and dads, young people, single parents to realise the great Australian dream of home ownership. Buying a home is an important milestone in people's lives. It is likely their biggest purchase and one of the most significant decisions they will make. A well-functioning and efficient e-conveyancing market is in the best interests of all participants. Competition can be a driver of innovation, increased service and lower costs. It is reasonable to expect that competition and e-conveyancing will drive enhanced outcomes for participants. To realise competition, we need interoperability. It is unrealistic to think meaningful competition will develop otherwise. The passage of this bill is a vital step in progressing towards interoperability. Interoperability essentially means the ability of different systems to connect and communicate. It enables them to speak the same language. The ABA is supportive of the passage of this bill and the two-step approach being proposed. A point I would like to emphasise to the committee is the need to ensure progress is also made on the payments aspects of e-conveyancing. It is vital that title and funds transfer at the same time. While this is not strictly related to the ECNL, I urge the committee to consider the time required for banks to develop, test and integrate systems changes to support interoperability. The ABA supports passage of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I'll throw to uh, questions from the opposition. Uh, Mr. Primrose? Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I've asked this question and I'll keep asking it of all witnesses to begin with and then I'll pass on to Mr Veach. Um, and maybe if I could begin by asking the um, Australian Institute of Conveyances first, do you believe an independent regulator appointed by the registrar to assess the readiness of participants and the interoperable system as a whole would help address industry and consumer concerns about cyber security and risk? Um, Maybe if I could begin with uh, Mr. Turner, do you have any views on that? Uh, yes, um, I, I do agree uh, that there should be an independent assessment uh, of the system uh, for the cyber security and the other risks. Um, and that will give uh, confidence uh, to both uh, consumers and uh, to uh, subscribers that the system is fully operable. The consequences of um, a failure uh, are uh, very serious and uh, they can be expensive and extensive. And uh, it is important that that confidence is inbuilt within the system. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hendry, do you have any further comments? I support uh, Dale's comments and supplement that with a recent example at 30 June where there was a system failure where we had only one Elno um, and we were lucky enough to uh, resolve those issues quickly with that Elno who um, involved the relevant state departments. So for that to occur while two Elnos are interoperating could only create significant concerns with respect to resolving any claims or disputes as to whose fault that was at that time of the outage. Thank you. And does the ABA have a, a comment on that question? I think what the committee really needs to consider is not further complicating an already complex space. It's just not clear to us what role that additional regulator would have. 
We think there has been sufficient consultation on this issue, on this bill, for a long time. You know, good consultation occurs you know, with public policy development that departments run well before it gets to the floor of the parliament for parliamentarians to consider. We, you know, we have been talking about these issues for a long time. We feel that we've been adequately consulted. Um, we don't think adding sort of further complication and further oversight would add a lot of value at this point. Thank you. Um, pass over to Mr. Veach. Right, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, I got, uh, my first question is really probably to the uh, is to the conveyances. Um, do you have any concerns about the implications of uh, interoperability on the safety and security of customers, uh, their information, and their finances? Maybe Dale. Dale Turner. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, yes. I, I mean, I have to admit. Um, I, you know, we don't have the knowledge, or I certainly don't have the knowledge of the, you know, IT requirements uh, that are involved uh, there. But um, yeah, we do have we do have some concerns uh, uh, as to uh, cyber security and those other uh, aspects. Um, but I, I think I think that that's more of an IT issue um, that needs to be considered. Uh, our concerns are more to do with uh, the uh, dealing with transaction failures. Um, uh, you know, setting up quasi, uh, uh, you know, uh, boards to uh, deal with these problems uh, when the, uh, you know, immediate resolution isn't available. Um, um, so we're, we're more concerned with the, you know, face-to-face, day-to-day, you know, -face, uh, -day, um, you know uh, transaction implications on the bill rather than those aspects of uh, IT and security. Yep. Ms. Hendry? Uh, I agree with Dale's comments. It, it is a concern, though, um, with respect to cybersecurity. Uh, we do, uh, from a day, like Dale said, from the day-to-day -day dealing directly with the consumers, most of our members or conveyances are SMEs, so the security of the platform or the system that we're using has to be paramount, uh, as most of our members would have the ability to have those high-level security systems uh, for cybersecurity in place, other may, than the basic preventative measures. May I just add that, um, you know, there is a view that with the more um, openings into the system, the more difficult and uh, the more complex that security issue becomes. But again, uh, that's a, um, you know, a, a, a question that really is a technical question with uh, cyber security. Agreed, Sounds. Can I also... Um, so the bill talks about a yeah, industry code. Uh, have you been consulted? Have the cases been consulted around the proposed industry code? At, at this point, no. No, the industry code is unknown. Uh, okay. And so for the ABA, have you, have you had any any input at all so debate around the industry code? Uh, I know there's an industry code on payments that is being developed, but that hasn't uh, progressed uh, too far, but that's in in progress. Uh, but to your question on the safety and security of customers, information and data, uh, it, it's an important question and it's a question that we should all consider. Uh, if I may, I'll answer the question more broadly and then come back specifically to interoperability. So I would say one of the things that holds the financial systems together is is trust. And by trust, I mean customers trusting banks to look after their, their data and look after their money. So for banks, it's an extremely important issue and a, and a matter. And it's something that they spend a lot of time and a lot of money uh, considering. Uh, and, and a bank simply wouldn't engage with a provider that they didn't feel had the, the systems in place, be that cyber security or cyber resilient systems. They didn't have the systems in place that would ensure uh, the protection and security of customers, uh, again, data and, and money. They, they simply wouldn't engage with that customer. Uh, any Elmo that is looking to join the system, they would know that. They would know that banks have an extremely high bar and they would know that banks simply would not engage with that provider if they didn't uh, have the adequate systems in place. So we look at interoperability. In a way, you could think of it if you're in a sort of an economic lens, you could think of it as market discipline. So those, either those elements that are currently involved or those that are wanting to involve, they know that there is that inherent market discipline. From a payment side, some of the details, as we said, the, the payments code is still being developed. Um, I'm confident that given the, the people that are involved, the technical expertise that's been involved by, by all the parties, 
that that code will develop a, a safe and secure mechanism. So from the safety and security, I say it's, it's an extremely important measure uh, and an issue, but it, it's it's not an issue that, that we have concerns about in this space. My time must be pretty close to being up, Mark. I'm not sure. You've got about four minutes. Oh, beauty. Okay, excellent. Well, I'll keep going then. Um, can, I, can I ask the conveyances then, um, do they have any concerns about uh, ELNOs offering services such as information searches, uh, brokering services, specific conveyancing software solutions and lodgement services as a part of this exercise? Um, we can start with Mr Turner and then maybe uh, go to Ms Hendry. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Uh, yes, we do have uh, some concerns. I mean, um, uh, PEXA um, uh, offers uh, some uh, searching services and other ancillary kinds of services. The real kind, um, um, we're not so concerned with that aspect of it. The real concern that we have is that they integrate into providing, providing an end-to-end -end conveyance service. In other words, they're providing those ancillary services, but in addition to that, and with all the information that they have, uh, that is subscriber information and information of the subscriber's clients are used uh, to integrate into a uh, full conveyancing service. In other words, they begin practicing conveyancing. That's our concern. Ms Hendry? Yeah, I agree with you. Dale's comments, it is it is a serious concern of ours that they will end up providing end-to-end -end services with the information that they have at hand. Okay. And, and my final question then really is, um, so what are the benefits? What, what, what do you see as the benefits of this reform? Well, why are we going through this process? Well, maybe I'll start with the, the bankers and, and then come to the answers to read that out. I think it, I guess it, it depends on your view on, on competition. So competition is often the, the driver of innovation and, and the mother of creation, depending on how poetic you want to be. So our view is we support competition and e-conveyancing. We support competition and we support competition and e-conveyancing. There, there's a number of ways you can look at what the benefits of this might be. You can look at it from the, the customer's perspective, that's sort of mums and dads and, and the Australian people. But you can also consider it from, say, the subscriber's point of view. If you think of it from a, a customer's perspective, so that's that's the, the people looking to go into the houses, competition should uh, drive down costs. So that would be the, I guess, the, the benefit for them. For the subscribers, they're the people actually connecting into the Elmo. So the mums and dads don't really see what happens inside the Elmo in any sense. For the, for the subscribers, uh, we would hope that uh, increased competition would would drive innovation, would increase custom service. And if the system is built correctly, that, that's what we would imagine would, would come of it. We do need to be cognizant that we don't create a system which uh, duplicates or creates a different burden for the uh, participants. At this age, we're, we're confident that that can be achieved. That's, that's, that's an issue, I guess, which will be developed uh, outside of the, the ICNL. That's more, uh, again, the, the payments uh, side. Uh, so really, it's, it's benefits for the customers and in theory there should be benefits for the subscribers as well. Uh, Mr Turner? Uh, yes, um, I, I, I agree that um, uh, we uh, all should support uh, the bill in the sense that it does create uh, innovation and it does create competition. I, I, I question the uh, cost benefit. Um, I uh, do think that uh, when looks at the uh, cost of maintaining this new regulatory system, uh, the insurance costs and all the other things that are with it that aren't a part of the system at the moment, whatever that costs, will have to be imported into the system and it will have to be paid for ultimately by consumers who are the end users. Um, but in saying that, uh, um, you know, I see that uh, uh, the bill is uh, necessary and it is important, um, but uh, we believe that it uh, should look at some of these aspects um, prior to it being passed rather than, as Michelle said in her opening statement, uh, putting the uh, cart before the horse. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I'll throw to Ms Boyd. Thank you so much um, and good morning to all of you. Um, I've only got a little bit of time. I think what I'll do is I'll um, I'll go to you first, uh, Mr. Turner. Um, I just wanted to understand from you as a 
as a practicing conveyancer, what um, I guess when you have um, been dealing with PEXA um, or simply or who, whoever you are joined up with, um, what sort of um, I guess arrangement is put into place between between PEXA and you as a user? Is there a subscription fee? What, what does that look like? Yeah, no, there isn't a subscription fee, but you have to enter into what's called a partition of uh, a participation agreement and that participation agreement sets out if you like the terms of conditions of being a member and the use of uh, that particular ELNO. Um, basically you're interfacing with software that uh, allows you to um, conduct a whole series of um, uh, practical things within the system itself, such as um, uh, it interfaces with state revenue, such as it allows you to do the electronic duties return in assessing the returns. It allows you to interface with the uh, um, yeah, New South Wales Land Registry. Uh, it allows you to interface with uh, the uh, financial institutions, whether it's an incoming mortgagee or a discharging mortgagee. And of course, it allows you to interface with the uh, other parties conveyancer uh, or, or solicitor. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to prepare the electronic documents uh, and to um, um, put the financial statements within the system. And yep. uh, finally, it allows you to uh, sign off, use your electronic signature uh, so within the there, system itself. Is there a, so I guess from a conveyancer's perspective, then you only want one service. So you will, you sign up just to one and there might be competition between which one, but there would be no circumstances in which you would be signing up to more than one. That's correct. And, and the analogy is if you had to sign up with more than one is a different gauge railway system. In effect, mm. you have to sign up with different ELNOs, with different participation agreements, uh, with different uh, sets of um, you know requirements within their participation agreements, which requires different training, um, mm. different uh, software and so on and so forth and it becomes very complicated. Um, so it must be seamless. Um, um, that is one of the uh, concerns that we do have uh, in terms of the definition of interoperability within the bill itself, um, that the uh, capacity of the registrars to waive what we feel is an, is an approval to become an ELNO, uh, meaning that uh, an ELNO doesn't meet that uh, level of qualification or requirement it is an area of concern for us. Just on that waiver provision, um, and thank you, that's very useful. I think, sorry, just going back a step, that's very useful to, to explain why the interoperability is required, I guess, because otherwise you would be obliged to, to sign up to multiple systems in order to be able to do every transaction. Um, in terms of that waiver, my understanding of the waiver is that it's it's really the provision is about sort of a temporary waiver um, until the system is ready rather than somebody getting a permanent waiver. Is your interpretation different? Well, um, I, I think it you know, is pretty clear. It, it uh, provides for the Registrar General to uh, waiver the requirements or the qualifications of uh, becoming an ELNO. Uh, and it provides that it can be done with waiving all the requirements and can be done on a permanent basis. And, and that, that, that is an area of some concern for us, yes. Thank you. I think what I'll do is put a, um, a supplementary question into the Registrar about that, um, just to clarify. Um, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a, a quick one to you, Mr Turner. The, the Minister in Estimates uh, last week, when I was questioning him about his this bill, he mentioned that it's actually lawyers that do the bulk of conveyancing um, and only conveyances do a little bit. Is that statement correct? No, I, I don't know where the Minister got his information. Um, in New South Wales, there are uh, over 1,600 licensed conveyances. There are over 500 conveyancing firms that operate in the cities and, and regionally. And in South Australia, I understand, and Michelle might clarify this for me, conveyances do about 70% of uh, all uh, property transfers in South Australia. So I, I don't know where the Minister got his information from. Yeah, SAWA and TAS do circa 90% of real property transfers. Okay. Um, if I, just to go to a point that Mr Veach was raising about uh, these L-nos sort of 
moving into conveyancing territory in terms of other services that they provide, um, does it, and you mentioned PEX, what PEXA is doing, but does it concern you that Simply, well, one of the co-owners of Simply has a significant market share in some of these other areas like property title reselling and legal practice management software and, you know, does it concern you that we may perhaps taking a monopoly and then legislating an entrenched duopoly and then essentially creating, I guess, a Woolworths and Coles of the conveyancing world and relegating your membership to essentially the corner shop of, of conveyancing? Does that concern you? Uh, yes, it does. Um, but but I, th I think as long as there's, there's a clear uh, distinction made, there's a, there's a conflation of what an LNO actually provides and what a conveyance or a lawyer actually does. And, and that distinction needs to be made very clear. So those kinds of ancillary services, such as providing searches and things like that, I don't believe that that's problematic. Where it becomes problematic is uh, uh, an LNO would also be able to provide uh, a, a, a conveyancing service. In other words, they'd be able to pra practice conveyancing. Um, mm. th that's where the th that's where the division actually is. I think, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Um, and if if I was to sum up your your position, uh, Miss Landis, that your members aren't really satisfied with the ministerial statement that where he basically says all your concerns will get we'll deal with that at the next stage. Is, would that be a fair summary of of what you're saying that you you guys aren't satisfied with that that ministerial promise that will will we'll address all those things down the track no i think we are satisfied with that statement as i said earlier we have been consulted on these issues for a long time there's been a lot of discussion amongst our members um, and with the new south wales government on this issue um, what I am saying is that we do think that a two-phase approach to the ECNL is, is pragmatic and a really important way of progressing. And we do have some minor concerns that we've raised with ARNEC, uh, but given there is this bill and there'll be a future bill, we think that the process gives us adequate opportunity to be consulted and to put forward our views. Sorry, Ms. Hendry, what's your view on that? Is that your, is, sorry, is that your view that are you happy with the ministerial statement that says we'll get to your problems at the end or at the next stage? Uh, with, with caution, uh, there was a recent example which Dale would be better to talk to in New South Wales about a statement made by that minister which has resulted uh, for the conveyancing industry uh, in additional costs and issues. If Dale, you want to talk to that example given it was uh, occurred in New South Wales? Uh, certainly, it was with the uh, abolition of the Certificates of Title uh, Bill, um, in which the Minister, um, and, and let me go back a step, there, there was a committee that um, a lot of um, stakeholders were involved in uh, as a part of this process that was conducted by the Office of the Registrar-General. At that committee, many of the stakeholders kept on asking for um, a long period of time if we could have an example of what was called the information notice. Uh, which was um, uh, supposedly in the Minister's um, uh, second reading speech in the introduction of the bill uh, to provide the same information that uh, paper certificates of title had previously provided. The only problem was, was uh, when the information notice was finally uh, uh, drafted, um, the information notice did not contain one of the most important pieces of information, which was the new owner's names on the information notice. Um, I would have thought that that was an essential uh, part of providing the same kind of information. Consequently, uh, what has now happens is uh, post-settlement searches are done, um, and a post-settlement search means that uh, an additional fee has to be paid. And it's, it's a small, but it's an additional uh, uh, part of the process in conveyancing that uh, everybody now goes, goes through to ensure that the transfer reflects the correct information um, on the uh, register. Okay, thank you. I might just go back to you, um, Mr. Landis and Mr. Harper. You say that you've been adequately consulted. Is that you as the banking association, or is that you, or are you saying the banks have been adequately consulted? Because from my understanding, banks have essentially been allowed no time to from the government to actually make the necessary operational changes. Um, from their end 
in terms of making sure that their payments and transfers but in this interoperable um, model will go through smoothly. So are you, are you saying the banking association is satisfied or all your banks have been, that are your members, have been uh, allowed adequate time to make the necessary changes to their computer systems to make this work? I'll, I'll link to that in two parts, if, if you don't mind, Chair. So there's, there's the ECNL, so that's sort of where we are to now. So we feel, we, the ABA and our members, so the banks, feel that they have been adequately consulted in the development of the ECNL. To the yep. point of have banks been given sufficient time to implement the changes, we don't actually know what those changes fully are yet. So there is a process in place. So there's a payments code that is being developed. So that's, you could probably describe that as in its infancy. So the way that, that we would envisage that uh, eventuating or coming to reality is that there would be a consistent way that Elnos 1234, however many we have, would interact with, with financial institutions. So depending on the, the detail of, of what comes of that industry code and that will drive what changes banks need to put in place, uh, the cost of those changes, the time uh, that will be required to put into those changes. Banks are large, complex places. And like, the, the most important thing for banks is knowing what they need to do when. So as I said, safety and security is number one priority for banks, keeping customers' data and money safe they don't like and they don't make changes that they're not completely sure will work. So that's why we, we have systems in place. As I said, we've got working groups in place and I'm confident that the right people, us and banks and other people in the ecosystem are on those working groups. So where we stand now, we've been adequately consulted on the ECNL. We're, we're happy with and we support its passage. As far as the detail of the payments, that's yet to come, but I'm confident that there's the right people and the right processes in place that that will progress as it should. Okay, thank you. I might throw to the uh, government for any questions. And do we have um, any government members there? I'll, ju I'll jump in there. And it's great to see that the ABA in particular have expressed confidence in the security of the system and um, and the, techni the technical infrastructure. Possibly, um, Mr. Turner's question for you, what other organisations have been consulted around that security and hopefully express similar confidence? Um, um, Councillor, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what other organisations have been uh, consulted, um, specifically uh, going to that security issue. Um, I, 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 that's the only information I can give you there. Okay, is that it, Mr. Barrett? I'm good, then, Chair. Thanks, yeah. Okay, well, I might. Um, are there any further questions from the opposition at all? Well, I'm, I, only one, if I may, and that's to the um, ABA. Um, has we had the. Um, um, situation outlined by Mr. Turner earlier in relation to names being left off a document. Do you believe that the same level of consultation took place in the development of that form as has been taken place in relation to this proposal? Uh, I'm not across the detail of that specific example uh, that, that was given, so I can't comment on that directly. Uh, I haven't had issues raised by, by the banks, by our members, around the way that the system currently operates or any issues or concerns around it operates. So I, I can't comment on that specific example, but no issues have been raised with us around the way that the system has been implemented. Okay, thank you. Mr Veach, do you have any other questions? Doesn't sound like it. Um, I just probably one one final question to the Institute of Conveyances, uh, Mr. Turner, um, or Miss uh, Hendry. Um, are you, are you I just are you satisfied? Uh, or are your members satisfied that this this regulatory model uh, will be workable, or or do you have concerns that you as conveyances will bear the brunt from the mum and dad 
uh, customers um, because essentially they they don't see they won't see the L nose as I think uh, the banking association rightly pointed out they won't see the L nose um, in this in this system they will see the conveyances um, if this system breaks down are you concerned that I guess you you will bear the brunt and the angst um, from the end consumer when it may not be essentially your your, your fault. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, in short, we are we are the ones on the day at, on the ground day to day and have to face the consumers. So if funds are misdirected or they're misplaced, we are the ones copping the brunt and having to deal with the consumer and their concerns and their stress. So we are concerned that this doesn't address or provide us with enough comfort or a framework that in these circumstances that these happen, there is a clear pathway to resolve it. Mm. And um, just pick up on a question from uh, my colleague, Miss Boyd, in, in the previous session. She she raised the idea of having a, I guess, a review clause, um, putting that at the end of the bill, but doesn't necessarily impact the passage of the bill or what, what is happening at a federal level but just may give you guys some comfort to say, if those ministerial promises don't come through um, in terms of those issues being addressed, at least at a state level, New South Wales Parliament can look at it and, and go, well, what's going on? We need a review. Um, why is it taking so long? Would you be opposed, well, this is probably a question to both of you, would you be opposed in having a review clause put into this, this part of the bill that, that sort of says, We'll look at it in one year or two years um, to see whether you know all those promises have been made and whether it, um, it is achieving what we hope it will achieve. Would you be opposed to that? I, I think that would be entirely appropriate, and, and I respectfully suggest that the um, following bill also be subject to the kind of scrutiny that we're going through uh, with the committee. Okay. Thank you. Any any comments uh, from the, bank, the banking association on that? I mean, I think a lot of pieces of law do have reviews built in for the future. But what what we really don't want to see is further delay to something that has already taken a long time. That we think there has been sufficient consultation. We really encourage the committee to recommend passage of this bill if there is, you know, an appropriate clause to build in to suggest that the success of it could be reviewed in the future. That might be appropriate, but. We don't support anything that will result in further delay. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no further questions, we might, um, or and witnesses don't have any further comments, we might finish a little bit early and uh, return back at 11.30 for our uh, next set of witnesses. But I, if there's no nothing further from witness, I thank you for your time um, and appreciate Chair, the evidence. Chair, we do have a second. Yep. Yeah. Chair, if we do have a second, there's one point I would just like to emphasise. There's a lot of issues around e-conveyancing is a very complex space and once you peel back the, the onion there's definitely layers there. I, I would really encourage the committee to consider what is the ECNOR looking to address, what is it looking to achieve? Of all those issues, of all the things that some of them as I said are yet to be developed, are still in train, still being worked through, there's a lot of detail yet to come. Is there a need to hold up the ECNOR to deal with these issues that in, in, in our view are being dealt with in other places and I said we have confidence that the right people the right places uh, are in place to deal with those issues so I would just emphasize that the ECNOL has a specific purpose we, we shouldn't lose track of that there are other things that we do need to develop that we do need to address but they there, there's systems in place there's processes in places to do that I would encourage the committee not to hold up the ECNOL because of those issues those issues should be dealt with but the ECNOL should not be delayed because of them Okay, thank you. Um, all right, well, that will that concludes uh, our time with you. So, thank you very much for your for your evidence, and um, we will break till eleven thirty. Uh, and I just uh, remind members that the live stream will continue. So, just make sure you mute yourself and turn uh, your camera off. Um, so, and we will see you again at eleven thirty. But thank you to all witnesses for their time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back uh, to the inquiry into the electronic conveyancing and adoption of National Law Amendment Bill 2022. Uh, we now welcome uh, witnesses from Simply. Uh, so, uh, starting with Mr. Joyce, can you state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Yes, I'm Philip Joyce, the CEO of Simply. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. And uh, Ms Singh? Joanne Singh, I'm the Chief Legal and Governance Officer at Simply. Uh, I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Would either of you like to make a short opening statement and, if possible, keep it to one or two minutes? Yes, Chair, I will. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. It's been a long multi-year journey and this ECNL bill is a vital next step in giving customers real choice in the e-conveyancing network. Simply strongly supports the timely passage of this bill without amendment or delay. Interoperability is essential to e-conveyancing competition. Without it, there is no competitive market. Every day that interoperability is delayed hurts the prospect of innovation, security, and lower costs for legal practitioners and working families trying to buy a family home. Every day of delay entrenches Texas' monopoly position and puts a level playing field for new entrants such as hotels further and further out of reach. We agree with the ACCC that interoperability is the best way to level that playing field and bring about sustainable competition for the benefit of customers. We also agree with the ACCC submission encouraging the committee to support the timely introduction of this bill. As you're aware, they also noted further delay to the reform timetable would likely see the incumbent operator, PEXA, become further entrenched in the market and barriers to entry heightened. The scale of the benefit to customers is really clear. In New South Wales alone, if you were to apply our Simply Price Card as it stands today to house sales in this state, it would save home buyers and sellers over $20 million a year. Industry expected interoperability to be ready in December 21. Action is already well overdue. Passing this bill is critical to keep momentum. The only player that benefits from delay here is the monopoly PEXA. We've already seen them delay the process and I'm certain you will see them advocate for further delays shortly. But let's not misunderstand their intentions. They wish to protect the monopoly profits for their shareholders. Every concern raised can be resolved through collaborative design work to create a safer, more secure and more resilient system for Australia. However, without this legislation, the registrars cannot regulate for interoperability and therefore the monopoly is refusing to constructively engage. Without this ECNL bill being in place, we have a hugely unsatisfactory situation of the monopoly incumbent dictating to their regulator their terms of re-engagement in this reform. Therefore, its customers are left at the will of the monopoly and they miss out on innovation, lower pricing, resiliency and redundancy enabled by competition. As you've heard from many of the stakeholders, this bill is based on extensive broad industry consultation dating back to 2018. It's been signed off by tripartisan ministers in every state. And we believe it's important for the process to be respected in its full current form without amendment. This is a key next step in implementing interoperability, but it is not the last step. There will be continued ongoing consultation to ensure that it's done safely, securely with the customer experience of the four countries. And I know a number of you will have questions about the security of the system, so I want to be really clear. Interoperability significantly improves the security of the e-conveyancing system by removing the single point of failure network that we have today. As we saw very clearly last year when the PEXA system crashed on 30 June, having only one network in the sector makes the whole system vulnerable if that one network fails. Interoperability improves infrastructure resiliency by providing a golden opportunity for redundancies to be built into e-conveyancing. It's based on mature, proven API protocols with best practice security, and it's the same secure and safe way in which LNOs connect to land registries, revenue offices, and banks to date. This committee in the New South Wales Parliament should be confident that effective risk and security interoperability can be developed by the combined experience and effort of the entire industry. For this to happen, the bill must be passed so we can crack on with designing and delivering a better system for Australia's customers. In summary, the ECNL bill is fit for purpose. It will achieve what it sets out to achieve and paves the way for further legislation and regulations to continue regulating the sector. Time is of the essence to introduce competition into this market for the betterment of businesses and customers. This bill is critical to that. 
I strongly encourage this committee to recommend in your report that the ECNO bill be passed without any further amendments or delay. To do anything else would be to further entrench a monopoly and a single point of failure. Thank you. Thank you. I will throw to the opposition for question. Mr. Primrose. Yes, thank you. Um, you must be disappointed that this um, bill's already delayed by at least 12 months. That's the case, isn't it? Uh, I'm really supportive of the bill in its current form, and I think I, like many stakeholders, want to get on with designing this to bring competition. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to answer the question. Um, uh, how many property transactions in New South Wales is simply processed to date? Please? Uh, in terms of transfers, not very many. We have less than 1% of the market today doing a very uh, defined subset of transactions. Our intent is to deliver a competitive offering so we can support uh, a significant part of that market. Okay. Um, in your submission, you indicated that competition would save people about $100. Could you please elucidate on that? Sure. Uh, as a matter of the regulation, our pricing and PEXAS pricing are a public record on our websites. If you compare the average cost uh, applied to a transfer, uh, we save on average a minimum of $100 per transaction. Uh, that's clearly seen by the document type and the transaction type. So if you apply that to the 200,000 uh, housing transactions in New South Wales, that's a saving of $20 million per year. And if you add to that the IPART um, efficiency gains for the industry of $8.4 million a year, we're talking about a $30 million benefit for the industry through competition. Thank you. And you would expect, of course, that these savings would go to home buyers? Yes. I mean, the industry protocol is a number of uh, most fees from conveyances pass straight through to home buyers. So this is this is money straight into mum and dad's pockets. So it wouldn't go to lawyers and conveyances as increased profit? I would think, uh, given it's a competitive market for conveyance and services, I, I, would, I would be pretty confident that um, there would be a huge market pressure to pass those fees on. Okay. Um, does the lack of a regulatory regime in the bill concern you? I think, as a number of stakeholders have said on this panel, that the bill is fit for purpose. It's, it does exactly what it, achieve, it needs to achieve, and the next stages of the reform will address the, the remaining concerns. The big thing that I'm worried about, and then in answer to your question, is delaying any further on designing a system that's safe and secure and competitive for businesses and customers. That's what we need to get on with. Okay. Um, I just need your technical advice on this point. The Minister has said that, and I quote, more ELNOs in the market means that if one is not available, um, we have more options for keeping property transactions moving in this great southern land, end of quote. Now, now is it the case that as ELNOs would be intertwined, if one's not available, could this prevent transactions from being processed through the available ELNO also? Well, let's put a bit of context to this. At the moment, there is only one platform. So if that goes down, all transfers are held up. And on June 30 last year, that happened. What we have the golden opportunity to do now is to design processes to rely on the two sets of infrastructure we have available for businesses and consumers. To be blunt, we haven't got into the technical detail of the design to make that happen because the incumbent has not come to the table since the end of last year to help design for that. I'm of the firm belief that we can design a more resilient, more secure, better environment for Australia. Okay, but is it is it the case or you just don't know at the moment? Is well, the Minister we've correct? We've got, yeah. we've, we've got two sets of infrastructure here. So we're, we're connected to all the land registries and the major banks. So as our PEXA, so you've got two, I suppose, in a mobile phone analogy, two sets of poles and wires. Uh, that gives us the opportunity to create redundancy and resiliency to ensure that homeowners and buyers and practitioners are not affected should one of the systems go down. But we need to crack on with the design to bring this to life. Okay. Does Simply offer software services such as information searches and brokering services Australia-wide and jurisdiction-specific conveyancing software solutions and lodgement services? No, we are an LNO. 
uh, we have, the only intent we have is to be an LO in this market. Um, so we don't offer anything that you would deem vertical integration, nor do we have any intent to do so. Okay. Um, can I, maybe um, I'd ask Ms. Sang to also comment on this one. Uh, can you provide an update into the status of the industry code this bill requests industry to develop? Uh, Councillor, you're in refer you're referencing to the, the payments industry code. Um, yeah. That is in its infancy. Um, certainly that, that issue is a separate issue to interoperability in the context that they are sort of processes that can be run in parallel to each other. So simply is committed to, to the development of that code and certainly will be participating in that when it commences. What's its status at the moment? Has it commenced? The, the, uh, the, the development of the code? It is in its infancy. So so the understanding at this stage is that it will be commencing in the next okay. month in terms of the development. Okay. The only thing I would add to that is we had a session actually earlier this week, all industry participants on Tuesday, and I think the deadline that was given was to complete this code by the end of this year, well in time to support interoperable transactions. Okay. Um, I ask this question of everyone. Um, do you believe an independent regulator appointed by the registrar to assess the readiness of participants and the interoperable system as a whole would help address industry and consumer concerns about cyber security and risk? Well, firstly, let me say that we take cyber security and risk incredibly seriously. And as I'm sure you're aware, the existing MOR has substantial security obligations for LNOs to demonstrate. And as the ABA mentioned on, a, on the earlier uh, witness, that we undertake significant cyber and security assessments from the major banks. In other words, they would not engage or put connections with LNOs they did not trust. The more pressing concern, I think, is not an independent assessor. It's getting on with the design of the system and the associated processes to address the concerns that other participants have raised today. Uh, the experts in this system are the, the participants you've heard from today, the LNOs, the AIC and so forth. I think other independent experts, I fear it would add further complexity when actually the New South Wales ORG submission outlined a number of the sufficient tests and readiness uh, hurdles that would have to be in place before we went live. So in that context, I fail to see the merit of um, identifying an independent regulator or assessor. So industry just wants government and parliaments to get out of your way? I think the, what's, what's been the, the, the hallmark of this particular reform has been, as you heard from a number of parties here today, has been the collaborative nature and the universal support for competition. I think we continue in that vein. Uh, but to, to, to reiterate the point in my opening statement, I think in that context, the bill in its current form is fit for purpose and should be passed without amendment. There have been, however, industry and consumer concerns about cyber security and risk. So I'll just ask again, Mm -hmm. Is there any, if it, the appointment of an independent regulator was something that would assuage those, would you see that being a problem? I think the merit of um, someone independent further reviewing the sufficient tests that are already in process through the MORE and through the implementation process is something that can be assessed in the next stage of the reform that should not get in the way or justify any delay of this bill. Thank you. My, my time's up and I thank you both for your comments. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Joyce, I'll just pick up on some of the answers you gave Mr. Primrose there. You said that you are currently only doing about 1% of the transactions, um, but you also said that you're, you, you signed up to banks, you signed up to registries. So my question is, if, if you're all ready to go um, in doing these transactions, why don't you have such a greater market share and why do you need the interoperability uh, bill being passed to actually achieve that market, greater market share. If you're ready to go, you signed up to registries, you signed up to banks. Um, what's holding you? What's holding you back? Uh, I'm sure you're, you're, uh, the committee might be sick of hearing this analogy, but I'll, I'll repeat it because I think it's worthwhile to, to bring this to life. We currently have a monopoly market, much like Telstra. So every participant to a transaction has to be on that network, which is exit today. So therefore, for us to be able to support transactions, 
Uh, conveyances and banks have to, what we refer to as multi-home, they have to subscribe to multiple L notes. The same as if you wanted to call someone on Optus phone, you'd have to have one phone for your Optus friends, one phone for your Telstra friends. Interoperability allows the L notes to communicate such that choice is in the hands of the end customers to choose their L note of choice. Absent that, we will not have a competitive market. Absent that, we're further entrenched in the monopoly. So today, uh, what PECSA have enjoyed for a number of years is the uh, the monopoly power and the whole network effect. So interoperability, let's not make no mistake, is a really important enabler of competition in this market. Okay, I'm just picking up another uh, question Mr. Primrose asked you about, I guess, the other the other services like title searches, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and you said you have no interest in getting into that space. Is it not the case that one of the co-owners of, of Simply is in that space, is in property title reselling and legal practice management. So are you are you saying that they're going to be two separate two separate businesses and they won't inter, intertwine uh, once this interoperability comes online? Because uh, there is concern. Uh, there is concern from there, I'll just put some context. There is concerns from conveyances that both yourself and Bexa will start uh, diversifying into some of their work, and we will go from a monopoly to an entrenched duopoly, and then you, you two will become the Coles and Woolworths of, of conveyancing and essentially push them all out. So, you know, can we get a response to, to, sure. to those Sure, I'm, I'm going to address that in two parts. So the first part was um, our shareholders. Um, yes, uh, the ATI group, we're owned by the ATI group, the ASX and, and staff. The ATI group do offer information broking services. In the mall, there is a clear separation between the companies, so that's enshrined in, in the regulation. As context, because I think that's really important, as you mentioned, um, it would be a strategic disaster for us to compete with the customers we want to serve. So remember, Impex have 100% of that market today. So you think about it strategically, why on earth would we compete with their services directly? Um, secondly, uh, to I think a bigger concern probably in the vertical integration is uh, an impending review of Diane Durham's takeover of Link, which is the ACCC are reviewing. They are actually have a bigger presence than our than our uh, shareholder companies, but the ACCC, I'm sure the committee can get further detail on that. As to your second part of your question, which was, uh, does this entrench a duopoly? I would strongly argue no. Um, and and re uh, again reiterate, we currently have a monopoly market. So what this bill does is compel Elnos to interoperate and it's fit for that purpose. What that legislative certainty does, it signals to other potential entrants that this is a market that they can enter. Absent this bill, absent interoperability, the barriers to entry are far too high. So if we want competition, if we want innovation and we want resiliency, this bill, passing this bill without a delay is a critical step to do that. Okay, just picking up on part of the first answer, is it not the case that uh, this family of companies or this ownership structure also has a legal and conveyancing firm called Settlement? And are you saying that that will be separate and that won't be part of the services you offer on, on this, this interoperability model? Yeah, that's, in, that's entirely separate. And my understanding of the satellite model is that they perform um, outsourced administrative tasks on behalf of lawyers and clients okay. who don't wish to do that. So a completely separate entity. Okay. Um, a lot of concern has been raised um, about whether the system's going to be ready, um, you know, the all knows are going to be ready, all that technical detail. I note that uh, simply sort of been saying since 2018 that they'll be ready to be competitive or on this model by the end of the year and that never seems to change how confident can you be and and fill us with confidence that you're ready uh for deployment in line with the government's timetable yeah so you'll be ready to, you'll be ready to go once once they sort of hit you know stage two i guess Yes, we are dedicating a significant amount of our resources to be ready to support this. And we've been a firm advocate of the time frame 
because again, just to reiterate, if we don't introduce competition here, we're left with a monopoly and we're left with a single point of failure. So it's of course in our interest to be ready, but it's also in the interest of customers and businesses that we are ready. And the interoper interoperability is ready to support giving them choice. Okay. Um, are you aware of concerns from a potential third LNO Lextech who, who said that the proposed model uh, will actually increase barriers to entry and entrench that duopoly. And I guess what are your what are your if you are aware of those concerns, what's your response to I guess the barriers to a third or fourth or more um, more LNOs entering the market? Uh, well, firstly, I can't comment on kind of Lex Tech's perspective, but I'll certainly give you mine, which is uh, this bill compelling LNOs to interoperate provides that legislative certainty for potential entrants above and beyond LexTech or others that they can enter this market and they can do so without the significant barriers of entry that exist today. All the technical design and all the legislative design is in no way geared to support a duopoly, far from it. It actually contemplates further elms. Today, um, that uh, there is zero confidence, I suppose, in, in the ability for us, for those barriers to be broken down. That's why this bill is really important. Absent that, we are left with a monopoly provider. And again, that stymies competition, resiliency, security, and so forth. Okay. Um, you, you might not want to divulge competitive uh, secrets, but innovation has been touted as, uh, as, the, um, as one of the reasons uh, for this bill. Um, and no, but no one can really point to anything concrete in terms of what this innovation will look like other than maybe a bit of surface work in terms of how the interfaces look. Is there anything that you can point to in terms of innovation that new players into the market will bring, obviously without divulging uh, corporate sure. secrets? Well, I, I, um, let's, get, let's put some context first. When one player has 100% of the market, we've got to do something pretty innovatively, haven't we, to attract customers to us? So the way I think about that is in three ways. Number one, we've got newer technology. So we have the ability to create a user experience and deliver what customers want, which largely is efficiency and time back to run their business. And there's a number of ways of doing that through the platform and through the workflow. We also believe we can do that through service. Again, as you heard from the AIC and others, a fundamental part of this is uh, giving certainty and service to mums and dads and helping advances do that. So service proposition. And lastly, delivering value. So again, it's a matter of public record. We are significantly cheaper than the current incumbent. So a mixture of innovation on the platform, the service proposition and value makes that an innovative offering. And that's without even contemplating what additional LMOs allow us to do and design as innovative for the market as a whole, particularly as it pertains to increased redundancy and resiliency. So I don't think I'm divulging anything there other than there are many, many vehicles for us to deliver better solutions at a cheaper cost and more securely to the customers of this market. Sure, thank you. Um, my time's elapsed, so I'll pass to the government if they have any questions. Thank you, Chair. Just a few. So firstly, we've heard from uh, some witnesses through submissions as well about how complex the technology can be. Uh, would you be able to just expand on that a bit more? We've heard that it can make it fragile, so to speak. Well, actually, if you boil it down to its fundamentals, interoperability really is the two L nodes communicating to each other through APIs. APIs is a pure um, technology. So the complexity is more in the design of the processes. The underlying technology is safe, secure, and used today by L nodes to link up and communicate, as we said, to land registries, to banks, and to revenue offices. I think where we need to crack on with the design work and why this bill is so important to pass is to get in the process work, and we mentioned this by the AIC and others, such that were there to be a failure, we have the processes to unwind those, the liability and so forth, to give confidence to the market. So actually, I think on the technology front, it's proven, it's secure. We just need to continue the implementation process the challenge we have today is without passing this bill, we have the incumbent monopoly not engaging in that work and not allowing us to design that safer, secure system. All right. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll give some time to my government colleagues and if they don't want to or they don't have any questions, I think we're happy to, to cede time here. I 
So I've just got one quick one that I think will be a quick answer as well. This technology obviously breaks down geography a lot, but are there any advantages or disadvantages to accessing this system based on where you live? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I think um, from a from a technology point of view, um, you know, we're we're Australian based as per per the more, um, and so I think the the focus here is on providing resiliency and redundancy. I think geography wise. I don't think so. so nothing else from the... Okay. Um, if there's no other questions from the government, before I close, just a quick follow-up. Um, a lot has been said about how this is a, a, you know, a collaborative process between all, all state ministers and um, et cetera. You're, you are obviously involved in the ARNIC process are you the ARNIC committee? We're, we're part of the implementation meetings, we're part of the working group meetings. Uh, we encourage PEXA to join those. Uh, they're, they're up next, you can ask them the same question. But yeah, yeah. we're, we're what, very what, much part of that. Yeah, what level of involvement do all the state ministers have in that? Are all state ministers in, uh, as actively involved in it? Or are uh, to, uh, I think the ministerial roundtables will be the public record for that. Um, what okay. I can what I can refer to is, I think we've got you know as I mentioned, kind of tripartisan support for competition. And why this bill is so important is it enables us to crack on with the design to create a system that delivers better better outcomes for customers. Absent that, any further delay does one thing: it benefits the monopoly. Okay. Thank you. Um, well. If there's no further questions, that pretty much uh, will take us uh, to the end. So thank you very much for uh, joining us and providing uh, evidence. It's uh, much appreciated. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. And um, we will bid you farewell and then invite the next set of witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. So we joining us now. We should have representatives from uh, Property Exchange Australia or PEXA. Uh, Hello. So, yes. So starting starting with you, Mr. Smith, stating your full name and position title, and swear either swear either either an oath or affirmation, please. Sure. I'm Simon Smith, the Chief Operating Officer of PEXA. And I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me should be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I'm Amy Thank Garrity, you. the Chief. Sorry. Uh, I'm Amy Garrity, the Chief Regulatory Officer at PEXA, and I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, would either of you like to make a short opening statement and if possible keep it to one to two minutes? Uh, thanks, Jay. Yes, I would. So, thanks for the opportunity. PEXA is a great success story, as you know, born by governments working together, funded by the private sector, and successful because it's won the support of 10,000 banks, lawyers, and conveyances after a decade of shoe leather, listening, and hard work. As Minister Don Dominello has said, e conveyancing is currently safe and secure, delivering big savings in money and time for all. Uh, and competition um, has been in place already for four years. Now, I'm, I've listened to the evidence this morning and read the submissions, and I'm guessing uh, that probably what you're thinking, some of you, is that everyone supports interoperability and here's PEXA holding out because it wants to protect its patch. So first, for the avoidance of doubt, PEXA categorically supports more and diverse competition. And our DNA is not that of a sleepy monopoly. We've proven ourselves a dynamic startup that has transformed an important industry for the better, and no one challenges this. And we're not stopping. Earlier this year, the Prime Minister in the UK referenced the excitement in the UK about the opportunities that PEXA bringing Australian expertise will bring to the UK. However, as a representative of the team who knows more, far more about delivering e-conveyancing than any other on the planet, I'm telling you that interoperability in its current form and on its current timetable is not safe and it will not deliver the grand sounding benefits you are hearing about. There is a huge gap between the appealing assertions of innovation, resilience and choice 
and the very superficial comparisons with telephone networks versus the reality of what is actually being prepared. Even the minister has made it clear that he is not across these technical details, and I don't expect him to be. But it is a fact that many of the officials in charge also do not understand the majority of e-conveyancing, particularly relating to financial settlement, because this is outside their area of expertise. Now, we've put our facts about this in our submission. We've put them out to industry and to the government, and these facts have not been challenged, so I draw your attention to them. Now, we've also set out our views on the many deficiencies in the bill in our submission. But what's remarkable is that not one of the submissions you've received from today's witnesses say this bill is sufficient to provide a workable interoperability framework. Not one. All the agencies and representative bodies say more work is required. ARNIC, ACCC, Law Council, Law Society, um, ABA and more. And they all highlight a broad range of gaps, consumer protection, timeline, enforcement, definitions, financial settlement, dispute resolution, insurance and costs, and so it goes on. And even the ministerial announcement, as has been said, confirms that another, needed, another bill is needed to do the job. So the proposition that's been put to you effectively says, don't worry about the defects in the bill because we can fix them in a second round. The argument is essentially that our competitor might lose interest in entering the market unless they are encouraged by a symbolic act of parliament. I'd instead like you to direct your attention to the interests of the consumers. That is the 15 to 20,000 homeowners and the businesses who rely on an ILNO every, every day. The submissions from the AIC and from Dench McLean Carson, which was the law firm commissioned by ARNIC to review the e-conveyancing intergovernmental agreement, paint a graphic picture of what is at stake. Families on the street with their cattle due to a delayed settlement or, in much worse cases, losing their life savings with no one to recover them. So I won't repeat those terrible risks here. But the critical point is, ARNIC is giving assurances that it can prepare and present a further bill with all the details needed to address the acknowledged deficiencies in time to keep the system and its users safe. And yet the plan on the ARNIC website announced by the ministers is to begin interoperable transactions in 121 working days. That's right, 121 days. Now, does anyone believe they can put safeguards in place in 121 days? That the officials can respond to the feedback they already received in November, draft a further bill, obtain approvals, bring it back here, pass it and commence the provisions in 121 days? Now, of course, they can't. And it took the example of the fact that it actually took um, 18 months to prepare this bill, a year longer than promised almost, um, it, it, it adds to that. It, and this is not a criticism of the officials. It is merely confirming the realities of their multi-jurisdictional operating environment. So what I'm saying is that the passage of this bill, unamended, provides authority for the commencement of interoperability years before the safeguards that everyone agrees are essential could be put in place, if they are ever put in place. That is why part of our submission recommends two critical safeguards that don't um, seek to slow the process, they're very straightforward, that must be added to this bill in its to proceed. First, protection for homeowners. The bill should be amended to include an independent expert assessment of readiness across the ecosystem. Require the expert to certify that there is no increased risk prior to pressing any go buttons. Secondly, include standard rulemaking processes to protect the industry. This, as you know, this bill is extraordinarily high level. It leaves almost all of the substantive decisions to unelected officials. And normally the New South Wales Subordinate Legislation Act would require consultation with affected parties about proposed new rules, not here because the bill relies on a loophole, which is to revadge what anywhere else would be called regulations as operating requirements, and so no consultation is required at all. As a former long-serving public servant, I have not seen a recipe for such poor regulatory processes. It will undermine confidence and create a lawyer's picnic. <laughs> and if the government argues that they can be trusted not to press the go button prior to the safeguards, then ask, why do they seek the authority to do so? Or why would they oppose such simple safeguards? Do they want to proceed without knowing it is safe? And do they want to make new rules without consultation? This is an industry where customers have zero tolerance for failure. It's serious business for everyone who's involved. Every family deserves to be able to trust the conveyors. None should be allowed to become a plaything for reform. They deserve equal protection. Finally, I would invite the committee to ask why there is no interoperability in the share market. Commonwealth Treasury, the Reserve Bank, ASIC and APRA spent more than five years looking into this in great detail. They concluded that interoperability is too technically complex and risky for share traders. And they noted that competition would arise without it, as it has. Chiax has more than 15% market share now, and its present has led to reductions in price and service improvements from the ASX, which incidentally is a half owner of Simply. If interoperability is too complex and not safe for the share market, why so for homeowners? 
as Minister Donnelly has said, Australia already has a reliable and secure service, world leading, and it is inexpensive. It is less than one quarter of 1% of the transaction costs of buying or selling a home. What we have here, I think, is a solution looking for a problem. We're genuinely scratching our heads trying to understand what would justify imposing such great risk on something as critical as home buying and selling, especially without safeguards. And I would say that when the troubles start, homeowners will ask who let this happen. I commend our submission to you and be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. I will uh, go straight to questions from the opposition. I think it's Mr Primrose. Yes, only two and then I'll hand to Mr Veach. Um, the, um, we've heard um, evidence this morning that the, um, despite the reliance, and I'll, I'll use the term regulation as opposed to operating requirements, um, the industry code's only entering consultation next month. Um, how long do you think that may take and, and does that lead to there being an increased risk about this proposal? Yeah, thanks for the question. So I think the code that you're referring to is the code to guide uh, financial settlement and payments. And I guess this highlights a feature of, uh, we think that probably take a year to work out that code. But the critical point about the code is that it's not a regulator. Financial settlement is outside of the domain of the registrars. It's an area they don't regulate now and that they don't un really understand. I have experts on how to do it. So even the existence of the code doesn't solve the problem, but there's no one standing there to make good if some if a family loses their life savings because a transaction went wrong. Like at the moment, PECs are indemnifies participants and will look after them, but all of that's based on, a, a, on, a, on an informal agreement that's in place between ourselves and the banks. Okay. My only other question is, um, and I've asked this of um, all the witnesses, but do you believe an independent regulator appointed by the registrar to assess the readiness of participants and the interoperable system as a whole would help address industry and consumer concerns about cyber security and risk? Uh, yes, I do. And as I mentioned in my submission, we think, I'm not sure they have to be a regulator, but I think they need to be an honest broker, an expert in, in complex technical platforms uh, who can uh, review readiness and planning and report publicly and say, all good, safe to go, or safe to go in some way, would just take a lot of steam out of this. I mean, the outage we had on the 30th of June was drawn to your attention previously. That really, really was a, a very tough day for us. You know, we worked really hard to make good. We paid compensation to people for being late. Um, it was it was the worst day for PEXA. And there's just could be so many days like that, day after day after day, if this proper assurance process isn't, isn't put in place. It, it, it's an unbelievably complex ecosystem. You've got connectivity with every registry in the country, every revenue office with the ATO. And this will all be times two because there will be two LNOs in interoperability plus the connectivity between the LNOs. Multiple more points of failure. Um, and we just can't afford to, to unleash a, a, a system that, that would be letting people down uh, over a consistent period of time. It would just be very, dis like way too disruptive for the, for the economy and for the community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Veach. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Peter. So essentially what you're saying then is um, uh, it would be worthwhile for the parliament to be involved with some sort of endurance or statement by the, uh, the RG for hitting the go button list. All those, all those tests have been put in place, you know, the, the rigots have been conducted um, and uh, and are being managed along with any analysis of the, the, the reliability of this. Um, and, and that should be provided to the parliament statement before we go live with this. Yes, whether it's to the parliament or to the public or, or whatever, the key, the key point is having that independent assurance. Like if I were to contrast this, for example, with what would happen if, um, like the reason it needs the independence is because it's not just what PEC, whether PEX is ready, it's whether PEX is ready, whether Simple is ready, any other ill knows ready, whether or the banks are all ready, having trained staff and so forth, whether the practitioners know what they have to do, um, whether the technical stuff is all, all ready. Like it's an immensely complicated thing. And I guess it, all of you, if I said big IT projects, I know what just popped into your mind, you know, when those things start, there's always problems. And at the moment, there isn't any, um, like I think, Arnick, Arnick was never set up to orchestrate a large competition and technical reform. It doesn't have people in there. It's very, it's very lean resources, and, and those resources are not experts in any of this. And so, at the moment, it's all just sort of fingers crossed. Let's 
whereas what there should be is a robust planning process, checking of dependencies, confirmation of preparation level in each participant, all of that kind of stuff, double, triple checking so that when, on, on the big day that things will go well. And just none of that architecture is present at the moment. So in your opening statement, you said uh, it was 126 days that this is supposed to be in place and ready to go, or at least yes. the next phase. Um, you've, as I understand it, we're already 12 months late, like this is already delayed. Um, so in PEX's uh, view, what is a safe implementation timeline for this? Well, I guess what we're saying is, and I'm, so I just want to emphasise that the delay in the legislation has got nothing to do with PEXA, it's to do with the complexity oh. of the process. Yeah. Um, the timeline should be when we're ready. And PEXA, PEXA has thrown itself enthusiastically all last year into basically showing how to design the system, educating our competitor and the government people on how to all the next work. Uh, we did pause towards just before Christmas late last year because we've done the prep that's necessary for the day one transaction and we've raised some important issues with, with the government and we've been working with Arnett to resolve those, with, resolve those issues. Um, but the point is, there was a timeline that was developed from the bottom up by an industry working group, ourselves simply and the officials, that went up to the Ministerial Council and it had 30 weeks just locked off it because it was too slow. And there wasn't any evidence put before ministers to say, um, this is the steps, this is how many, these are, this is the steps one after another, this is how many they are, this is how long it's all gonna take. But none of that, it was just saying, no, no, too slow, do it faster. And so I'm, we're just very nervous that um, the go button gets pressed because an announcement is required Rather, the go button should be tied to readiness. Okay. And um, does PEXA intend to offer other software services, you know, like information searches and um, or brokering services and the like as a part of the uh, the new operating environment? So it's, there's, there are some very strong regulatory protections that control what an ELNO is able to do. So if, if, a, if a company like, um, like PEXA or, or, or simply uh, wanted to set up what's called an upstream or a downstream service, that it has to create a formal separation between um, the core exchange and that other business service. But PEXA, um, it does not own any conveyancing firms and it's not owned by any company or controlled by anyone else that does own a conveyancing firm. So we're, we're, not, we're not a competitor uh, in the conveyancing space. But I think you heard um, the previous witness explain that in fact, uh, their owner is in fact in the conveyancing space. Yeah, and I think my time is now up, Chair. I'm just looking at the WhatsApp and notification. Oh, you've got about 50 seconds. Oh, good. Okay, one very quick question. You, you mentioned the standard uh, the standard rulemaking instruments and your concerns about those. Um, could we fix that in, the, in, this, uh, in this bill process? Yeah, I think probably if you just made a provision that said that operating requirements should be uh, uh, should be dealt with as if they were regulations in each jurisdiction, you'd get exactly the same. You'd, you'd achieve the outcome. You don't have to construct an elaborate scheme or anything. Thank you. Thank you. I will pass to uh, Ms Boyd. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and good afternoon uh, to the two of you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, in your opening statement, you mentioned about how it was sort of too difficult for the ASX and CHIAX to, um, to have any kind of interoperability, et cetera, and I'm not going to delve into what their technology issues were. Um, but of course, since 2003, we've had um, international clearing, um, sorry, international central securities depositories being Euro clearing Clearstream, uh, having interoperability and trading um, securities in huge amounts, in huge volumes, um, and that's been going for almost 20 years. So clearly interoperability, once it's set up, um, can work really well. Um, what's your view on, I guess, the vibe I get from you is that you think it's all maybe a little bit too difficult. Are you saying that interoperability cannot occur or that we need to work out the details before we green light it? Okay, yeah, thanks. So. Two responses to that. But the main reason that I draw the comparison is to just highlight that it's not us making it up, that it's a high risk and complex and technical thing to do. That those very experienced economic regulators looked at it for five years and decided that in that case, that should not proceed. So we're not saying interoperability can't be done. We're just saying it's very complex and technical and needs to be done with great care and not, and not rushed. I suppose um, what, we, what we're worried about in this bill is that it kind of locks in only one particular form of competition 
uh, extension. So it says, um, for example, um, if, if I was a, a business and I wanted to enter the Elno market and I wanted to say, I don't want to have to replicate all of the infrastructure that PEX has already built. I want to just be able to come in as a retailer, use pay to, to access PEX's infrastructure and offer services to niche markets or just stages of the process or whatever, that, that would be a genuinely innovative outcome. But the, the legislation, the way interoperability is defined, the way ARNIC is proposing it says, no, no, you can't have any of that. The only kind of competition, the only kind of ELNOs we can have, have to be exactly the same as PEXA. They have to build all of the infrastructure themselves, they can't share, uh, and um, and, and they have to offer all transactions in all jurisdictions uh, eventually. So, so what we're saying is that there's been a kind of a, you know, a strong voice for one particular thing to be done to intensify competition for one market entrant. But to our knowledge, neither the ACCC nor ARNIC nor anyone has ever sat down and said, okay, what is the actual problem here? What is the impact of that problem and what options could be considered? So, we're, so we just think they kind of jumped to one way of doing it. But obviously, if, if other entrants were required to, I guess, um, take off of the PEXA uh, model, you would be getting something from that, wouldn't you? Would that you wouldn't be giving that for free? So that technology would then be something you would license to the other people, or what's the? Well, I guess the analogy is a bit like electricity retailing. At the moment, mm -hmm. you can't require every retailer to have their own set of poles and wires down every street. We have a, a regulatory framework that says, well, we only want one in the street. And we say, here is a wholesale business that hmm. provides that infrastructure. Uh, and here are retail businesses that are that gain regulated access to it. And I'm not saying that's definitely the answer. I'll, I'll, I'm just saying hmm. it's, that's been ruled out now. But if that was the case and other organisations were required to sort of, you know, I guess, licence from you, um, that would, as well as improving um, your profits, it could also mean that, um, I guess, actually, let's look at it the other way. If you, if we um, don't require that, and so if we have the interoperability uh, model as it's currently proposed, um, if those other organisations can't kind of reinvent the wheel and they can't come in and, and have their own product, then wouldn't you benefit through maintaining your monopoly? Because there'd be less, like there'd be higher barriers to to entrance? Well, well, I mean, Simply's told you they've, they've already duplicated the infrastructure. So I'm not saying that it's only PEXA who would be the one who could offer the wholesale service. What, mm. I'm, what I'm saying is that there's no there's no credible suggestion that anyone is going to build a third lot. There is, there is the prospect of other forms of innovation based on a retail model, but they've been ruled out by the legislation. So we are, so the bill is locking in just to exactly mm. the same. And so I, 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 I just think it's it just hasn't been thought through. And, and I'm not saying that's not a reason to delay the bill. I'm just mm -hmm. saying as a background, lots of talk about competition, but no analysis about yeah. what's required. Just one final question, because I know that my time is limited. Um, the I absolutely agree with you that this is an incredibly technical and um, like it's a big IT project. And I have been personally involved with the European securities um, clearing houses and, and the tech involved there. And I do understand just how complex that is. Um, but clearly that's why we are putting in place here um, the interoperability working groups and, and committees so that that, that work can be done. Um, but we've heard that PEXA ceased participating in most of those meetings from last year. Why was that? Um, and I guess, how do you expect the work to now be done without your input? Yeah, well, um, we have not withdrawn from the bulk of the processes. There's one, there's a stream that we're not, that we've paused our input on. So we're, we're still working uh, in the payments code space. We're still working on the pricing issues. We're still working on the legislative issues uh, and we're working on um, other matters that I'll elaborate shortly. But the not reason, the interoperability committees, correct? So the particular committee is the um, operations committee, which is the, where the technical experts come together to devise the data standards. Now that committee, we put in like, a thousand hours of intensive effort all through last year. And on the basis of what we've learned, we could see that there was a big gap between what was what people were expecting would be offered by interoperability and what was actually going to be offered. So for example, resilience. 
so there's a concept that the idea is that if we've got two networks, if one's down, then that's all fine. We can just use the other one. But in fact, as was explained by the um, AIC witness, people are legally in a legal uh, agreement to sign up with one ILNO, whereby they've established their identity and made undertakings about all the things that they have to do. And so they can't just switch to another ILNO unless they're also a subscriber to that other ILNO. So people think, oh, great, one's not working, I'll just pick up the other one. But it's not actually true. It, we've actually made it more complicated because transactions will require um, someone's using Simply, someone's using Pexta. If one of those ILNOs goes down, then that's the end of that transaction. It would have to be restarted completely in the other ILNO and only if everyone is a subscriber to both of the two LNOs. So people just go uh, blithely say, oh, yeah, resilience will be great. But if you get into detail, it's not actually true. So we, we could see this and various other very significant problems emerging. So we were, I wrote to Arnek and said, look, we've got all the data standards we need ready for the first stage of the rollout. That's been completed. But there are four issues that must be resolved. Otherwise, it's a train wreck about heading. It's, we're heading for a train wreck. The first was the timeline, because as I've, as I've described, it's been artificially truncated and there's no it's, it's tied to an arbitrary date, not to readiness. Um, the, the second was pricing. So Arnek had put out one paper about pricing that said ALNOs will set their prices for each other as they have for customers. Then they put out another paper that said, actually, they must perform their central function for free. In other words, they have to do all the work but not get paid for it at all. Then they, the, the, the third point was um, about these, these concerns we have in the legislation that we've outlined in our submission. Uh, and, and fourthly, we were, we're very concerned about the ability of Arnic to stand up the capacities to be the market steward that is now required. So by way of background, PEXA over the years has, has stood in the place of the steward, custodian of the data standards on behalf of everybody, managing mm -hmm. the relationships with all the different states and territories on their ever-changing requirements, looked after mm -hmm. how it all fits together. So in a competitive market, we can't do that. The government needs to do it, but they don't have any people to do it. So... Um if I, no. Sorry, if I could interrupt you, because I am out of time and, and the chair is going to tell me off in a second, but can I just pick you up on that interoperability point where you said um, that if you had, for example, if you had a PEXA and a Simply transaction that were interoperable and then, yeah. say, PEXA went down, then the Simply, want, the Simply transaction wouldn't be able to occur. Clearly, yeah. that would occur if it was all within PEXA as well and PEXA went down. So yeah. but you've what, only got what one, is the additional one, risk? Well, because you've only got one system that that is that is involved if you've got two that's more points of failure it's quite it's very logical like sure every, they're every all going to be regulated the same a, way every transaction so depends on the chain to... of everything going right between about 10 different computer systems only in an interoperable transaction there's going to be 20. that's all so there's it's just and, and you can't um it, the transactions are moving up until the moment of settlement people are making changes to the detail and so, yeah. and there comes a point where it's locked. And, and anyway, it's very, it's but if very every locked. system is, is yeah. regulated to the same standard. Anyway, sorry, Chair, back to you. Yeah, sorry, I might uh, pass to the government and um, if there's any time at the end, I'll, I'll do some mop-up questions. Um, Mr. Martin, are you, are you got any questions or Mr. Barrett? I'm okay, but if Abigail wanted to continue that line, that's all right with me, unless Scott was ready to jump. No, nothing for me, yeah. Miss Boyd, did you want to continue that, or are you happy for me to do some mop-ups? No, you go ahead, and if there's time at the end, I'll um, I'll come back in. Okay. I, um, Mr Smith, I just wanted to provide you a bit of opportunity um, because the minister has repeatedly mentioned that PEXA represents vested interests rather than the public interest, um, which sort of makes an inference that your opposition to this bill is purely on the desire that you want to maintain your monopoly. So I, I would just pro provide you an opportunity to give a right reply to that. Yeah. So th thanks for the opportunity. So we are very proud of what PEXA does. I mean, we are, we are, we used to be a government controlled body. The government's decided to vest the function in the private sector when they sold their shares. Uh, so now we are a private company and we don't hide from that. We're, we, we're very proud to have thousands of Australians 
uh, individuals, lawyers, um, superannuation funds, etc., as owners of our business. Um, and we're really excited because we think this year, after 10 solid years of investment, will be our first year of profit. And that's good. That's really exciting. We're proud of that. Um, however, like every business, if we don't, we only survive on the goodwill of our customers. If we don't deliver for the 10,000 lawyers, conveyances and the banks, then, then our, our business has no long term future. And we work incredibly hard to achieve um, and retain their goodwill. So we have a net promoter score, which we, which we test very regularly, of 76, which is the envy of almost any other business. We have a, an independently assessed um, brand and reputation score of eight and a half out of 10. We have, there's an incredibly high level of satisfaction in the services that we offer. Um, we, have a, we have a field force of people who are on the phone helping all of our customers regularly, and we're known for that. that we, we consider that to be our secret source. So um, our interests are exactly aligned with, the, with our customers' interests. And in, within our company, uh, it, it's customers first every time. So, I mean, you could make the point that we represent vested interests, but that would be true just by legal definition. Um, we have shareholders and, and we need to deliver for them after 10 years of investment. But as an operating business, it's all about our customers. Okay, thank you. And I just want to pick up on a point that you made about, um, I guess, you know, the system being ready. Um, it's not just the IT, I guess, infrastructure or the eco IT ecosystem, is it? Like, um, with any any sort of big change in an industry or in an organisation, it's actually managing, I guess, the individual, the employee, and it's it's managing that change, managing them through that change. So, would you want to see a this readiness report uh, or a readiness assessment also look into that side of the readiness, so not just the IT ecosystem, the tech, but also whether you know the banks are ready in terms of their workers, the the registers are ready in terms of their workers and their systems, and you know, would you want to see that as part of the readiness assessment? Absolutely. So, for example, our understanding of the government timeline is that zero weeks have been allowed for change management in industry, and it's just not practical as the ABA. Uh, representative said, banks are very large organisations. They take nine months to a year to make a process change. I think what the banks were told early on was nothing would change for them. But that thousand hours of work we put in last year shows that that's just simply not true. So, for example, we, we offered tools that large organisations use to tra keep track of all of the matters that they're dealing with at any one time. So they're able to see what's coming up, what needs to be done today and tomorrow and next week, and to allocate work out. Uh, to their to their staff. Now that system only works because the data that tracks where each transaction is at um, it is already uh, captured by us and used to generate that report. But an interoperable transaction interoperability doesn't include data fields that are necessary to support that tool. So that tool is going to have to be switched off during the interoperability uh, if a transaction becomes interoperable. So the banks will need to develop different processes that kick in. Once a transaction is interoperable, from their side, they'll need to say, uh-oh, this is not the normal type, this is a different type of transaction. We'll have to have a team of people who are trained specifically to be able to operate um, with the different requirements um, because of the nature of the, of the transaction. So absolutely, you're right. The readiness is not just about the tech, uh, the readiness is about the people as well. Um, Thank you. Okay, if I could just grab some of our time back, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I just want to put it um, to Mr. Smith because it has been said and it's been circulated. And look, I even raised it in an earlier question to an earlier witness, but it has been circulated about PEX's lack of involvement in the process here and in some of the consultation and in some of the design of the system. Um, do you like to? I'd like to give you the opportunity to respond to those sorts of comments. Yes. So I, I, I did partly address this earlier, explaining that we are not. We haven't walked. We haven't thrown our toys out of the cot. We are still very actively engaged in multiple streams of the interoperability development process. The part that we have withdrawn from temporarily is writing the, dan the data specifications required for stage two of the rollout. So we've we've stayed to get stage one ready which enables preparation to be made for stage one. Uh, but in relation to stage two, we said, if the timeline is, stays what it is, we probably need to build a different thing because we're gonna have to have a scaled down version of interoperability as the first stage one. 
And we've asked ANIC to give us an answer to say, well, is it the timeline that, that's going to give or is it the specification that's going to give? Because we'll have to build something different and we don't want to design something and then have to redesign it when the inevitable happens and the timeline is delayed because not everyone can get ready. Okay, thank so, you. And I'm, 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 I'm just saying, we're not trying to spoil the process, we're trying to avoid a, a train wreck by premature implementation. Okay, and, and can I ask if you have an, any estimate of your current market value and an estimate of what that may look like um, given different levels of competition that will come online? Um, well, our market values as displayed by the ASX, I, I'm sure that the investors in our company are each forming their own view about uh, the pace and likelihood of uh, changes in market share uh, and uh, probably better better place to speculate on value than I am. Everyone okay. knows that interoperability is coming. It was very clear in our prospectus. Um, people form their own view. Thank you. Ms. Boyd, you've got about 20 seconds. Do you want to fire anything off? Uh, no, I think it's covered now. Thank you. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, that, that takes us right to time. So thank you uh, to our witnesses uh, for appearing uh, today. Um, it's been very insightful overall, I think. And um, so just once again, thank you for your attendance. And I'll just remind the committee we'll have a quick deliberative at the end uh, here after we bid farewell uh, to our witnesses. So once again, thank you very much for your time.